Thank you very much. You may have a seat. Ladies and gentlemen, media, stakeholders, all protocol observed, welcome to the Nation Brand Forum 2019. I'm Joanne Joseph, and it really is lovely to be with you this morning. Just some housekeeping rules, first of all. This is a smoke-free zone, uh, so the restrooms are marked clearly on the outside of the venue. Please, can I ask that your cell phones are now turned on silent? We encourage you to tweet and tag during the course of this morning. Uh, the hashtags at... Well, at Hashtag Nation Brand Forum 19. Now, with the above in mind, this year's NBF will focus on collaborative actions. It will speak about interventions needed to renew the South African nation brand. And of course, we're living in a time right now where we need our country, all of our country, men and women, to buy into the idea of what South Africa is all about. And uh, we need to renew. civil society media are going to participate in this year's forum. And the main objective, really, of the 2019 forum can be articulated as gathering input and stakeholder perspectives on particular interventions necessary to renew the nation brand as we move forward as a country. Now, to reach consensus on a possible plan to inform Brand South Africa's strategy going forward, as well as indications of areas, issues, platforms, and partnerships necessary to achieve these brand revival objectives, these are the kind of, of discussions and gatherings that are going to be happening. So to actually kick off our proceedings, I'm going to introduce you to uh, our Honorable Minister, Jackson Dembu, always been an apartheid act activist uh, who was part of the liberation struggle. Uh, I knew him many years ago uh, as spokesperson, and we have interacted widely in, in that regard, and I always found him to be a man of honesty and integrity. And uh, before being appointed as the minister in the presidency, you may know he served as the chief whip of the ANC in the National Assembly from 2016 till 2019. He resides as minister in the presidency. Minister, won't you please come up? and address us. Thank you. Next, the body says, stand up, refuse with my permission. The chair of this session, acting CEO of Brand South Africa, Ms. Tulisida Manzini, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to Brand South Africa's fourth annual Nation Brand Forum, a platform created and engagement on how South Africa's nation brand identity and narrative is repositioned. Nothing much has a sense of shared national pride better than the countries consciously making efforts in nation building activities. And nothing unites a people better than sport, arts, and culture. I'm certain we are all proud of how our Springboks have been showcasing our sports progress in the 2019 Rugby World Cup. In Japan, having secured South Africa sport in the finals, with their phenomenal performance against Wales yesterday. I hope all of us were watching. I was definitely watching. We have no doubt that the box will bring back the Rugby World Cup to our shores at the end of this tournament. We wish them well in the finals against England next Saturday, next Sunday. Go Boke.
As a nation, we equally pride ourselves with the performance of our national netball team, the Spa Proteas, who were crowned the 2019 Africa Netball Cup champions last week. Our young people have also been showing the world what we are made of. The Ndrofu Youth Choir, Youth Choir left us with goosebumps after their recent performance on America's Got Talent. How can I forget the pride I felt when I watched Trevor Noah interviewing one of our own, DJ Black Coffee, on Trevor Noah's Daily Show? Not forgetting our starlet, Shoma Josie, who brought home Best International Act from the BET Awards earlier this year with her recent single titled John Senna, making international music charts. We cannot forget our Soweto Gospel Choir, who have consistently flown earlier this year. These are just a few examples of moments that make us proud to be South Africans. We are truly showing the world that we are an inspirational nation to be reckoned with. All these phenomenal achievements in the arts, culture, and sports sector are a, manifest a manifestation of how far We have, in only 25 years, created a thriving democratic dispensation which enshrined in our constitution the freedom of expression, access to information, media freedom, and independent chapter nine institutions supporting our democracy, which have ensured that all South Africans are able to freely exercise their democratic liberties. Our political system is one which is envied by many other nations. We have consistently, over the past 25 years, held free and fair general elections. The most recent for the eight political parties registered to contest. There were 19 more parties that contested since the previous national elections held in 2014. This is indicative of a maturing democracy within a political stable environment we have created since the dawn of democracy. We have created a representative legislature, an independent judiciary, and an executive which serves all people of South Africa irrespective of their race, class, gender, or creed. Our constitution also recognizes the institution, status, and role of traditional leadership according to customary law in our society. We have in only 25 years created and crafted a nation where a people who were previously systematic apartheid system now live together in a peaceful and harmonious society. Our democratic government has achieved this through crafting pro-poor policies, which have ensured that the previously disadvantaged black majority have equal access to basic services. Our 25-year review document, which will be launched by President Ramaphosa next month, I see it's written next month, maybe let me be precise, on the 8th of November, at the University of Mpumalanga, stand invited, uh, shows the significant strides we have made as a democratic government and as a country. We have delivered services such as water, electricity, sanitation, and housing, including provision of social support to the indigent, encompassing a special municipal services dispensation 
fee free basic and higher education for the poor and free public health support as well as social grants. Our government has ensured that people have the right to live in urban areas, removing in particular the compound hostel status of our township, whilst improving the rural areas and working for a better life for all. All the indices bear out our contention, not only about the delivery of services, but about advancing the transformation of the state from an insular apartheid machinery to broad-based democratic and unemployment. Our country needs a thriving economic sector to drive development and transformation imperatives designed to improve the quality of life and a better life for all. As an entity, Brand South Africa was established with the strategic aim to make an indirect contribution to economic growth, job creation, poverty alleviation, and social coercion by encouraging local and foreign investment, tourism, and trading through the promotion of Brand South Africa. We also have country heads based in the United States of America, the United Kingdom, and China, with the sole purpose of promoting South Africa in order to improve the country's global competitiveness. South Africa is, is currently edition of the Global Competitiveness Report published by the World Economic Forum. Eighty-second, amongst 190 economies on the ease of doing business, according to the latest World Bank annual ratings. Whilst on the African continent, we are the third, the third biggest economy following Egypt and Nigeria, respectively. South Africa is also ranked 35th in the world for has heightened expectations for ventures like the Square Kilometer Array project in the Northern Cape, where the world's largest radio telescope was erected. Innovation is a short of nation building. Thus, we look forward to housing many firsts, creating a secure future for our children. During his first of the, his State of the Nation address for this sixth administration, President Ramaphosa outlined the seven apex priorities uh, for government for the next five years. With the transformation of the economy and the creation of jobs being the first priority of his government. The low levels of economic growth and high levels of unemployment which have recently escalated to an alarming 29% uh, requires government and all stakeholders to come together to forge a new economic path for the country. In appreciation of the need to put the country on a new economic trajectory, Treasury recently published an economic policy paper of which the public has made valuable input. We look forward to our Minister of Finance delivering our medium-term budget policy statement this coming Wednesday, which will outline a new economic plan for the country to ignite growth in various sectors of our economy and create much-needed jobs. Building a nation brand requires that we lean on all pillars of society. Of society from business, government, and civil society. It is only when we collectively and effectively brand that we will all be able to attract investment in our pursuit to grow our economy. But in achieving a coherent nation brand, we cannot turn a blind eye to the recent acts of violence against women.
and strongly condemn anything that seeks to break down the foundation it collectively took us to build. As the South African government, we have acted strong, strongly by arresting the perpetrators of public violence and have implemented multifaceted plans and intervention to prevent gender-based violence in our country. We want to strive for a violence-free future that allows all to thrive in the country of their birth. Public perceptions of corruption and state capture. Now, every time we say public perceptions, something inside me says, no, no, no. These are realities of South African life. Corruption and state capture have equally tainted our nation brand. It is for this reason that government established a multi-pronged approach with corruption and state capture through, amongst others, the Public Audit Amendment Act, which gives the Auditor General of South Africa the power Yes, Government has also established a, a series of commissions to unearth, to unearth allegations of state capture with the National Prosecuting Authority Investigative Directorate in charge of all state capture and corruption related. <laughs> of course, we, we all know this commission that has become quite fashionable uh, in our daily interactions. The Zondo Commission doing a sterling job Key to building our nation brand is our participation at international multilateral forums, which forge international relations and cooperation among states. Amongst others to note, South Africa has had the privilege of chairing SADC. The AU is currently chairing the presidency of the rotating chair. Oh, this, this that I In fact, from next year, January. As we all know, we are chairing the rotating chair as we speak now of the United Nations Security Council. So we are there. Uh, we are equally proud of our participation at forums such as the G20 and the World Economic Forum, having recently hosted the World Economic Forum on Africa in Cape Town. We also chaired the Presidential Infrastructure Championship Initiative of the African Union, which aimed to improve continental infrastructure, railroad, water, electricity, insofar as these are aiding and abetting sub-regional, regional, and continental integration. Our participation in this forum is a clear indication that we are part of the family of nations as brand South Africa. The investment drive initiated by the President Ramaphosa, 1.3 trillion over the five years, which will be used to, among others, build infrastructure both in the public and private sector, and ignite the growth of our economy needs, all, needs us all as active citizens to find meaningful and sustainable ways to ensure that we alleviate poverty and grow the South African economy so that we are able to realize Vision 2030 as espoused in our National Development Plan, which remains our lodestar. As we build up to the second annual South African Investment hosted next month here in Johannesburg, it has become increasingly important that we join hands in profiling South Africa as a competitive business and investment destination to global and local audiences. We want people of the world to fall in love.
to invest with us. Several pledges were made last year by both domestic and international investors to the tune of 300 billion with the aim of reviving the country's economy. I was speaking to the president before coming in. I said, President, what do you think we will be able to get from what you want this investment of 1.3 trillion? Will we get there? We are standing at 300 billion now. Will we, will we get there in November? You know what he said? He said, watch this space. But he seemed very confident that South Africans are coming to the poor, both our local partners, local businesses, and international investors are coming to the fall because they would like to see brand South Africa succeeding. We have also given them reason to come to the fore through what we have done, uh, which we have spoken to earlier, including dealing with persistent corruption and state capture in our country. So this has motivated business internationally and locally to say this is brand South Africa we can work with. This is brand South Africa we can assist to deal with all the difficulties brand South Africa is faced with, difficulties of economic growth and difficulties of job creation. Enhanced nation building is a shared responsibility. Therefore, I do challenge you fellow colleagues, fellow South Africans, fellow business, men and women, fellow artists, I've seen a few, fellow media personalities in attendance here, professionals in various areas of your trade, and ordinary us. I challenge all of us and all of you to find your niche and utilize it at your optimum. South Africa is on journey of transformation to eradicate inequality, unemployment, and poverty for the sake of social cohesion, inclusive growth, and an innovative society. It's our story to tell, and we must all commit to elevating the nation brand identity at every opportunity granted to us. I thank you. Blueprint, where democracy of people, the freedom of expression, where the people are guided by the spirit of Ubuntu and humanity is at the core of our ethos. Our spirit of determination unleashes our true potential. We are people with a distinctive charm, people with big hearts. We come from a people of integrity, dignity, and great humility. We rise above every situation and limitation, for we are resilient. It's in the way we talk, the way we always willing to offer a helping hand to us and the world. From the beautiful skyscrapers of our cities to the Karua farms, our distinctive mountains and rivers. There are a number of factors that define our nation brand. Through its people and heritage, we are proud of our diverse cultures, the rich legacy of our forefathers that has left the anchor of our tomorrow. We are innovators, game changers. We dance in triumph as our feet vibrate on the African soil, where our hearts beat as one. Vehicle 
able to carry any brand message is through its people. At the heart of our nation brand, it's a simple yet very powerful movement that seeks to unite its people towards encouraging everyone to play their part in advancing South Africa's reputation and image. We inspire, we empower, and we celebrate active citizenship. We lift the spirit of our nation. We contribute to positive change. We are a nation of people who care deeply for one another. And our desired outcome is to create an active society that contributes to a prosperous economy. Oh, They, they remind us of, of just what we forget every day and the, the humdrum of our daily lives. So when we feel very, very weighed down by some of the difficulties in our country, it really is wonderful to be reminded of why we should be so proud every day to be South African. So I, I want to thank you, Minister, first of all, for sharing your thoughts with us on, on how we build that pride as a nation. And thank you for also not glossing over all the work we need to do in terms of gender-based violence and so forth. And, and uh, you know, this is all part of the, uh, the battle we face as we go forward as a country. But these are things we can overcome so long as we start working together. And I love the, uh, the question you asked, what can we do to make the world fall in love with South Africa? I, I think that's such a wonderful personal mission for each of us to think about. Thank you for those words. And we always try to keep inspired as citizens of the country, and certainly your words are going to help us think about that a little bit more. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as you arrived, you would have noticed a pledge wall. And we encourage you to pledge and honor your community. How do you partner with Brand South Africa to share content or material within your sector that can be leveraged to enhance the nation brand? Uh, secondly, how can you make available resources or platforms within your sector that can be used for collaborative engagement internationally? And thirdly, how can you align your organization's active citizenship activities with Brand South Africa initiatives? Just give that a little bit, a bit of thought and go ahead and make that pledge. We really urge you to do so. Uh, not all of you have also been using the entire hashtag. I'd just like to remind you... It Brand Forum 19. So please don't forget the, the 19 at the end of that. All right, I'd like to introduce our next speaker at this point, award-winning Pan-African marketer, non-executive director on private and public the country with him and, and work with him, a true professional in the way he carries himself and so well respected all over the continent, a pioneer really. 100 Africa's best brands. He's worked on over 100 brands across Africa. He's been to over 100 countries worldwide and every single country in Africa. I mean, not many of us can really say that. Tebe Kalafeng is arguably the foremost global African branding authority and he's the founder of Brand Leadership. He'll discuss with us I Am Africa, Crossing Borders, Dodging Bullets, and Connecting Africa. Tebe, please come up. Oh, I love my notes. I love my notes. I don't want to be like Lumco. Lumco was busy going line by line. He's the man that's on the right line. <laughs> <laughs> I was watching you, Lumco. I was right next to you. I was right next to you. So you can imagine, um, a few years ago, I was at, um, I'd gone for a meeting at Samsung, and I was meeting with KK Park, and I said to KK, how come Samsung is in every single country in the continent. Why does everybody have a Samsung phone? And he said to me, simple, I've been to every country in the continent. I was like, whoa, a whole Korean has been to every country. And I'd only been to about 15 countries in the continent at that stage. Then the second one, I was speaking in Switzerland. <coughs> so every year I go to Switzerland to, um, to chair a, uh, an entrepreneurial panel. So I've been running, I'm so unfit. I've run out of energy just from here to here. <laughs> so unfit. Um, <laughs> Can imagine it's embarrassing. At 53, I should be doing much better than this. Um, so, um, uh, and and so I was, I was, I was sitting in, before my, my panel. I was sitting and I was watching the chair, uh, one of the chairpersons of the of the Communist uh, Party, sitting a woman, uh, and she was talking there about uh, about her country, China, how amazing China is. And then a young 
PhD, you know these PhDs are very smart. Um, so a young PhD boy gets up uh, from Switzerland and he said, oh, you're sitting there and you're acting so amazing, talking about great stuff about China and all those, where, while you guys are busy suppressing Tibet. He allowed him to speak, let him express himself, and when he was done speaking, he asked him a simple question, have you been to Tibet? And the guy said, no. He says, I'm so sorry to hear you speak so ill about a country that you've never been to. So 2003, President Tabumbeki, then President Tabumbeki, was at the Indaba. I wasn't there then, I wasn't on the board of, the, of tourism then, um, and he <laughs> saying, if I had to take time out as a president, what would I do? He says, what I would do is, I would travel the length and breadth of the continent. And he started painting the picture of Timbuktu. Talking about my continent, such a beautiful My own time, money, and resources. As a South African, I used to be proud to see South African airways everywhere. Uh, so one of the jobs that we need to do as South Africa is to rebuild our national airline to be that airline again. Because as I was traveling the continent, I've, I've delivered African airlines. And of course, Ethiopian took me to most countries, was a connecting country, but I used to it's important we do that because it starts with us. Because if we don't support our brands, uh, our, con our countries and our continents are not gonna go anywhere. So what are some of the highlights? So I'll share with you some highlights and I'll draw, I'll draw in the end uh, uh, why is it so important for us and why this journey was so important. Of course, everything starts with the name. Uh, I was in Kenya on the weekend and I was speaking to some of my friends and, and you know, I only realized recently that Kenya, all the street names are Kenyan. Because they don't have Queen Victoria there and because uh, Queen has been gone for a while, I think he even doesn't remember coming to Africa. Uh, but so if you go to the rest of, oh, so all of Kenya, there is no Queen Elizabeth or Queen whatever. Obsessed about, should we change the name, should we do this? We're in Africa, let us have the names that reflect who we are and where we come from and the people that we can relate to. Uh, that's just what it is. Uh, of course, our continent is an amazing name. If you look at the name, uh, what the name itself means, it means without cold and without horror. That is our continent. That's our continent. And, it, and the only way you can experience this, and throughout my travels, uh, that's pretty much what I, what, what I felt. So what happens throughout these borders? Uh, I used only one passport, African passport, South African passport. And I only stayed in the continent. I only left the continent once. Uh, to go to, uh, po uh, uh, to Portugal, to go to Cabo Verde. I could have stayed in the continent, but I decided because I didn't have much time, I needed to get there sooner. I could have gone for there from Senegal. But you know, it was also important because when you talk about our continent, people always talk about the obstacles. I said, where are the obstacles? If I can travel the whole continent, staying in the continent, using an African, South African passport, there are no reasons for none of us to be putting obstacles in front of our continent. Of course, our passports is a very interesting, easy passport to travel with to start with. That, ho that helps a little bit as well. Um, uh, those are all my stamps, all my visas throughout, uh, throughout the whole continent. To the, I want to see where the real Masai's are. I said, I don't want these commercial Maasai's we see in, the, in town, the ones who make money out of, uh, out of all the ignorant people and selling them overpriced beads and all those. I said, let's go hang out, because the way I travel, I like, to, to, I like to stay with the real people. And he says, no problem. So we drive, 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 drive. Two and a half hours, it's an Uber. Two and a half hours later, I'm like, hey, are we arriving? So two and a half hours. entry visa, I can't go out with my, 
the driver says, the Uber driver says to me, don't stress, don't stress. Let us just go speak nicely to the, whole, to, to the immigration folks. Let's tell them we don't have passports, but we are Africans. <laughs> so, so, so across, across over, uh, we walked in, we say, we speak to them nicely. They're like, where are you from? We like South Africa and Morocco. They're like, where do you want to go? <laughs> to do what? We're gonna hang out with the Maasai there on the mountains. They like, oh, okay, <laughs> just come back. <laughs> Who needs borders? <laughs> no. So we did, and we did not have to bribe anybody. I haven't bribed anybody on this entire trip. Did not have to bribe, because you know the first thing people think about, oh, you must have paid him something. Zero. Our continent is not corrupt. The people may be, but not the, not the continent. So, so you may find pockets of corrupt people, but we are not a, a corrupt. Our con <clears throat> so of course, uh, those of you who travel that border, you know, you can just walk across and walk back. Uh, <laughs> you know, they work here and they work there. <laughs> <It's just laughs> So I can tell you stories, but you know, start on the board of tourism. They're gonna say, Tabby, you can't say things like that. <laughs> so, so we'll have that story for my book when it comes next year, because then I'll be off the board. I can do things like this. <laughs> uh, so I'm driving from Lagos, three hours. We're going to Benin. So I said to my friend, uh, when are we arriving? He says, We're in Benin. I'm like, Whoa, uh, Benin? Uh, where do, what do you mean, where's Benin? Um, he's like, Yeah, yeah, yes, immigration. <laughs> no. <laughs> there's, pe there's people with makeshift of things. I'm like, oh, okay. Now, where do we, where do we stamp out oh, here? And where do we stamp out here? <laughs> so, so if you travel this way, interesting. So uh, borders are interesting. I'm not sure we need these borders. I'm not sure we need these borders. I know as South Africans, uh, we tend to think everybody will cross the border and never, never want to go home. Everybody loves their country. They want to go back to their country. That's the one thing I've, 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 I've realized. Whether I'm in a little place in Djibouti, whether I'm in a big country like um, a, a big country like Ethiopia, the first thing when you arrive is, where are you from? South Africa, ah, oh, Mandela. <laughs> Incredible brand. Everywhere you go, Mandela. Everywhere you go. So that shows to us uh, how important it is to understand. Uh, and that's why, you know, when the president, uh, Sura Ramaphosa, always talks, says, we need to go back to the values of where we come from, the values, not necessarily from Mandela, but the values embodied by Mandela, because those are South African, uh, South African uh, values. So how are you gonna travel this continent? And uh, if, you, if you really want to understand it and to learn it, well, if you reject the food, you don't like the customs, you fear the religion, and you want to avoid the people, folks, stay here. Don't go anywhere. Nobody's going to, nobody's going to harass you. So you can imagine, um, I don't know if it's midlife crisis, it can't be midlife crisis because I'm over 50, so it must be late life crisis. Uh, so late life crisis, I got on, I went on to a proper, a proper adventure. But everything had to start at the top. Because I figured I had to start my journey at the top of the mountain so that I can see, wow. So I've done, I've done a couple of Kilimanjaros, I've done mountains all over. I don't talk about the other countries out of, out of the world, but I just focus on my continent. Starting at the top of Kilimanjaro, it's important. Because you need to rise to the top of your country, your place, your continent, before you can go out into the world to claim how great you are. And I know a lot of us want to first be recognized by Grammy uh, and Oscar and all those in Paris and all those to say we've arrived. You haven't arrived until your mother says you've done well, my child. <laughs> so charity begins at home. Charity begins, I don't know where to point this thing. Charity begins at, um, at ah, charity begins at home. Uh, um, so, Melissa, we must, we must do this trip together. We must jump off at, 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 uh, 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 over the Zambezi with the crocodiles looking at you, uh, looking at you deliciously at uh, Victoria Falls. And we must, we must go to Namibia, just hover over the sand dunes off of an aeroplane, just jump, I don't know, I've done some suicidal things, I guess. Or over Cape Town, or over Durban. So I thought, you know, this trip is going to be different. It's not going to be that slay queen and slay boy uh, trips. 
where people lie on beaches and sitting with champagne and says BMG and says, look at me living my best life. I said, my life is going to be... But it's going to be damn good. And, you know, I said, That's, I'll do everything... ...from to Zambia, which is 52 hours. A cockroach here, a cockroach there, but who's watching? Uh, you know, it's really none of our business. They also won the ride. They were also on the ride with us. Do you know this train, what's interesting about this train? Uh, it speaks to African visionary. Because in the 70s, uh, Kaunda and, and Nyerere uh, talked about, this, about, this, about the importance of creating a train that's going to connect from, uh, from Cape to Cairo. And they said, we're going to start this journey here. They didn't finish it. But I know the rest of us are saying, hey, but they didn't finish it. Well, it's a baton. Somebody has it a relay. They do their first leg, you pick it up from there and we move on to the next part. So that's our job. Our job is not to say they didn't finish the job. It's to ask ourselves, what can we do? Sorry, uh, my words are falling. When people talk about the continent, they always say it's war. And folks, I have seen war. I have seen wars everywhere. I have seen wars between Zambia and Tanzania. On the one side, they call Musiwa Tunya. On the other side, they call it uh, uh, Victoria Falls. It's the same one. It's the Victoria, whatever you are. So you know the people always tell you, they're like, oh, but Tebe, you must watch the, the, the Vic Falls from our end. I said, okay, I'll jump from your end, and I will sit in the devil's pool from your end. Just a little tap. It didn't happen. I've seen wars. I told you, this is all about war. So the Minister of, uh, of Tourism of Uganda says to me, Tebe, you haven't seen silverbacks until you come to Uganda. Then the same ministers of Rwanda says to me, but we've got the best ones. So I'm like, let me go visit my cousins, you know, and see how they're doing. And my cousins, whether from Uganda or whether they are cousins from Rwanda, are we got to bond with them? Where been? Because, you know, we're so similar. We're so similar. But the beauty about this is just the commitment to the, about the Rwandans and the Ugandans about protecting the environment and about protecting uh, this very rare species. And that's quite important uh, that, you know, I was with my friends from, um, from uh, Nigeria the other day. I said to them, do you know, I've been to Nigeria so many times. Do you guys have game reserves? Have you got all those things? Ella, oh, oh, God, we ate them all now. <laughs> so, so, so our job is not to eat these things. <laughs> Our job is to make sure they stay here. There's a reason they exist. And the reason there is war between Nigeria, Ghana, Senegal, about who makes the best jollof. So I ended up in Gambia. And in Gambia, I met uh, Madame Aida. I invited her for Af Africa Day. I, I hosted probably the most Pan African uh, gathering uh, ever uh, put together in this country. Oh, in this continent. I have Africans from everywhere out in the, in the, in the farms uh, in, uh, in, in Joburg. Uh, the invitation just says, dressed as Africa. And, and I said, to, and I invited Mom Ed, I brought, I brought her from Gambia. I said, we are going to cook jollof proper because she won the best jollof rice, beat all those Nigerians and those Ghanaians. But of course, every country I arrive in West Africa, I always tell them, your jollof is the best. <laughs> Whether it's, uh, we need to start, people are going on about the McDonald's index. I think I need to start the fat cake index because I've eaten Maguinga in every country. And people always say to me, do you eat fat cakes? You don't get fat, I say, we're a good stepping. Uh, you know? <laughs> but you know, but Maguinas are everywhere. The worst ones must be Kenya, because there's nothing inside. I don't know what it is. I, think, I feel like I cheat. I feel like I cheated every time I eat in Kenya. Of course, the beauty about food is that the man who doesn't travel think that their mother is the best cook. You gotta get out into the world. <laughs> gotta get out into the world and you eat. I eat everywhere. I've eaten anywhere. You know, Nunin Chingila says to me, Tebe, you must have the most, the strongest constitution. I said, uh, I said, well, no, no, well, <laughs> you know, I eat everything. So. So I'm finishing eating. You, you eat the best too. Minister, I'm, I'm sitting with my driver in, because you know, I, every country I go to, I go, I, I tell the people, let's go eat where the people eat. 
He's like, show tea, let's go eat. It's like, you are brave, let's do this. So we, we eat. The stew was the best I've ever had. I am eating. And I said to him afterwards, I said to the chef, I, I said, uh, Monsieur, what is, this stew is nice. What is it? The meat is a bit different. I said, what is it? He says to me, it's fresh meat. I'm like, yeah, beef, lamb, work with the brother. I can see he gets a bit angry about what this thing is. So I decided, uh, let me not offend, because you know, I told you before, if you don't like the food, move on, stay home. So I decided, okay, I'll move on, eat the finish the food, enjoy it. As we drive out, I see people blow torching monkeys. I see people cutting off tails from rats as big as the ones in Alexander. Anybody from Alexander, you guys can relate. Anybody from here? There you go. One, two, three. A few from Alexander can relate. Cutting off. So I say to my driver, Queens on up, what are they doing there? They're preparing fresh meat, sir. I'm like, <laughs> Minister, I've answered you. So you travel, of course. Uh, one of the first things I do in every country. Sometimes uh, I get stopped by security everywhere. I was stopped by security in South Sudan because I wanted to go to the founder's uh, area. Like, what are you doing here? I'm like, I'm going to see. I said, like, don't come to my country and come and look for my founder. <laughs> I was like, but he's dead. He's just a statue. <laughs> he's like, don't. But in every country I go to, I go to the memorial. I go there because I want to understand how they marked their freedom, how they memorialized, remembered those who brought them uh, the freedom. Go to. Whether, it is, um, whether it's in Cabo Verde or Cabo Verde or... Because, you know, uh, Amilcar Cabral fought for the struggle of Cabo Verde as well as the struggle of, um, of Guinea-Bissau. So whether it is going to his... Um, you know, and amazingly, all the people who were there then, are still, some people are still there. Because I went with a general who fought with Amilcar Cabral, and he walked me uh, uh, in Guinea-Bissau, and he told me the story of how he was killed in, uh, uh, in Guinea-Conakry and all those. And, uh, and I looked at the statues. Everywhere you go in Guinea-Bissau, there'll be statues of Cabral. There'll be names of streets. There'll be all those. I said, it's important we do that. You know, or whether you go to, um, uh, whether you go to Ghana, you've been to Ghana, obviously, m most of you, uh, if you haven't been to Ghana, all of you are going in December for the year of return. Um, or if you go to Heroes, hey, but we need to bring Uncle Bob. Uncle Bob needs to be buried there because he created this. So we need him there. I thought the Heroes Acre of Zimbabwe is probably the most magnificent of any ones I've seen. I've seen, I've seen them all, as you can imagine. And then I come to my country, then I say, hey, my country, they've got that guy, I don't know his name, I call him General Pretorius, let's just run with that. Um, they've got him there in front of, the, or, or in front of parliament, and they've got, then they asked Dali Tambo uh, to do a little statue of Mandela. I'm like, hey, comrade, uh -uh. the statues of the people who brought us freedom should be bigger than those that we found here. But we should not destroy any of the statues. As I was I said to my driver who spent uh, a year in jail in Libya, I said to him, um, uh, and, 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 and the general uh, in the Guinea-Bissau, I said to them, where are the statues of those Portuguese who were trampling all over you for years? He's like, oh, we don't have them anymore. I said, why? He's like, you know, we, we regret it so much. But I said, but how are you going to tell your children where you came from? What happened before? Why, why was there? How are we going to explain Mandela here? How are we going to explain Mandela here if we take away uh, all those statues of, 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 of all the colonists? You need them here so you can explain Mandela, you can explain OR, you can explain everybody else. Because when they see them there, they then can make the relationship. He exists because of, uh, he, 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 we exist because he, overcome, he overcame this and we should never ever go back uh, to that again. <coughs> But of course, my favorite statue to me, my favorite monument to me, has to be the, 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 uh, the $50 million one uh, put by, uh, by Wad uh, from Senegal. Uh, and when you put it, I know all of us will say, $50 million on the statue? Well, what had it right? He put it so high, it's taller than the Statue of Liberty. The top of it, so we can see the future of the continent. And that's important to do that. Let's not do little people, uh, you know, sometimes when I go to our, to some of our places and I see uh, our, our, our heroes, they're like little midgets. I'm like, ah, 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 ah. Those midgets got to go. Uh, we need tall people because these people were giants. They make little toys and see people are going to play ping pong with them.
you go through, um, if you go through Elmina, they say Elmina stays in you. And it's quite important that you go. You know, I was at, uh, I went to our four checker. I've done, I've done uh, pro most probably, most if not all our South African ones as well. Uh, and I went to four checker. And as I was walking through Fort Chaka, I saw this young African guy downstairs. Uh, because you know, we've got the, the old flags, the new flags, you've got all those. And he was walking with his family, and I was just behind him, and I was just walking. And he's holding his son, and he looked there, and he says, Die a sponsor land. And I said, That's why you keep a Fort Trekker, but you create a bigger Fort Trekker uh, for South Africa. Because you want our children here to also walk around and say, this is who we are. This is how we arrived here. You cannot wipe out history uh, because you, need, you, re you require that history. So when you walk through there, whether you are standing at Bore and you're standing at the door of no return, it's important to do that. I love Bore because Bore is a mixture. The people are living there. I've got about 1,000 families living there. And they've, and they've got everything that uh, used to happen there are, are still there. Or whether you go to, uh, to, uh, to Rwanda, you know, Rwanda, there's a church that's just outside of Rwanda, about an hour out, exactly where the genocide took place. A million people are uh, killed. A million people killed um, and, uh, in, um, uh, in, um, in, in three months. It's important to remember that story. It's important for that story to be alive. I must say I'm not a great fan of the apartheid museum, only because I don't think our story needs to be next to a gambling place. I think our story needs to be bigger. Uh, it needs to be in, an, in a better place, and it needs to be curated as raw as the genocide museum tried to do it. I feel like we're playing games as a country when it comes to remembering where we come from and what it took for us to get here. We need to do a better job as a country. That's how we're going to build this country. Because, you know, when you're trying to build uh, or tell people about the story of South Africa, they don't understand. You speak to the millennials. I like to make up stories. Because they speak English because we say to them, oh, my child can't speak Shizulu because they speak English at home, at school. We're like, whoa. You can speak English and it's his own. And you grew up in a township and you have the duality. But your child must be poor parenting. <laughs> I will run through this African time. You know, people, talk, people always talk about the negatives about African time. Uh, but African time, I'll be here. Uh, uh, African time. Hey, I started late. <laughs> 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 uh, African time. <laughs> African time, uh, African, you know, I was, I was sitting in Tanzania, I said to my friend, um, it was about five o'clock. I said to him, uh, five o'clock in the afternoon, I said, shoot, I need to go somewhere before. Uh, what time does the, the shop close? He's like, oh, you got time. I said, what do you mean? I said, what time does it close? He says, three o'clock. So I'm like, hey, uh, my brother, it's five. <laughs> He's like, no, no, you got lots of time. It's three now. So I sat down with this brother to work out this time, and he explains to me, oh, no, no, Tebe. We are using Kiswahili time every day, just like in Ethiopia. So African time, that's why, you know, we always have time. Because in our continent, time works for us. We don't work for time. <laughs> you, know? you know, that's why the taxi doesn't move until it's full. <laughs> but the how train, because we didn't come up with that concept, it moves on time. <laughs> it's a problem with the how train. It's using foreign concepts in Africa. <laughs> ah, people are amazing. Ah, people are amazing. If you talk, as Mandela said, you talk to some of their language, you go straight to their hearts. Um, so I'm in Somalia, Mogadishu. Because I had to go to Mogadishu because a friend of mine said to me, you can't go to Somalia if you don't go to Mogadishu. I'm like, hey, but they're dropping bombs. Uh, they dropped one two weeks ago. He's like, yes, but um, you can't go to Egeja. That's not Somalia. You got to go into the real deal. So I said, okay, we'll go to there. So I'm, so I'm walking in Mogadishu, and I'm trying to see this only church which has been bombed. And I meet this guy, the soldier, there, because he's the one who's soaping. And the soldier says to me, ah, you Tswana, right? I'm like, yes. You from Kimberley? I'm like, yes. I'm like, yo, this guy's a Sangoma. <laughs> you know? I said, how do you know all these things? He's like, I used to live in Kuruman. See that people have been here and they know us and they can recognize us and they can see us here. They can see us in them. Um, 
I'll skip this, I'll skip this story right there. Of course, style is important. You know, style evolves over time. Uh, and it's important to assert ourselves. You know, people say to me, oh, Tebe, you know, you used to win GQ best dress. You used to wear the best suit in this country. Now you start wearing all these clothes. What's wrong with you? <laughs> now, what happened to you, Tebe? You've changed. You know, when I say, oh, I'll Oh, but nobody said Mandela changed. <laughs> they just said he asserted himself. <laughs> you know, so asserted who he is and his identity. You know, I've spent so much, I've spent more time with KK than probably any president in my life. I've spent weekends, days uh, eating at his house, walking for official places. We spoke about a lot of things. And I tried to understand why that handkerchief. He said, Tebe, I, it became a symbol when I came out of jail in Rhodesia. Uh, so that I said, I bring peace. And this is a symbol of peace. Uh, that you can see. And it's been consistent. When I'm in Guinea-Bissau in church, I love this priest because I thought, wow, he's integrated the best of both. Uh, of, of, of both. Or whether it's Laduma, who's making us appreciate where we come from, uh, as, a, as a, what we were. Or whether it's, hey, that's Tebe. Um, whether it's me, uh, as, as, as a dress as a, in, in a Ghanaian, uh, or me with the hangout with the Maasai's. Uh, you should not apologize for who you are and how you present yourself as long as you are presenting the continent. Uh, so that's why when my friend from Ghana said to me, I'm getting all these bloody politicians to wear African because they can't look like colonial uh, leaders and only Obasanjo looks like an African. Uh, you know, and so, <laughs> well, they tried, you know. Like, you know, I know our president was so proud to wear uh, his suit from, uh, from Cape Town. Would have been even better he had arrived as a, as a vendor, you know. Would have been, as a president, you are, you are now we are talking, uh, uh, it's a vendor. Whether we are praying, you know, I'm, uh, in, uh, I'm going to close in the next minute. Um, you know, Africa is an interesting continent. Because we, 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 and I say Africa, by the way, South Africa to, from Cape to Cairo. Uh, because when you meet people, because, you know, there's a lot of churches. Sorry for those who go to these uh, uh, sentin churches, commercial churches. Um, um, <laughs> Because, you know, when you meet all these new converts uh, from with these new uh, religions, uh, when you ask them, how are you? Highly favored and blessed, and how are you? <laughs> because, I mean, it's like we're not there. <laughs> so, so, and um, or, or in Ghana, they say, oh, by his grace, I'm doing well. Uh, and when you look at why his grace is doing, 90, over 90% of Ghanaians identify with God. I'm not saying they're going to heaven. That's a different subject. I'm just saying. Uh, uh, to them, as my friend, my late friend, um, um, uh, he said, he says, in Africa, uh, religion is the Unilever of, of, of Ghana. Because there, you know, billboards are all about church, <laughs> like it is here now of late, uh, you know. Uh, you know, and some of us believe in things which never happened. That's how Bushiri, um, Bushiri, you know, Bushiri wanted to invite me to go speak there. I said, ah, Bushiri, I'm not coming uh, to speak at your church because you raise people from the dead. Some of the people are one dead. They used to stay dead. <laughs> no. And he says, Malawis believe in God. South Africans believe in miracles. Uh, so religion is quite an important, interesting thing, whether it's in Timbuktu, uh, whether, it's in, um, whether it's in Ethiopia, that the churches there, you can see me on top of the churches and inside uh, uh, the, the, uh, the churches there. Or it's Liberia. You know, Liberia probably was the most fundamental church I went to. As I left that church where the slaves came back, uh, I was there. I went, as I left the church uh, where the slaves uh, came back to, uh, to, to assert their independence in, uh, in 1847. Uh, and... Uh, I could never ever forget that, that church service. Could never, but religion is that important to us. Um, in the last few slides, uh, we're a very ingenious continent. Whether it's Asmara, it took me forever to get to Asmara, but I got there. Whether it's looking at the pyramids in uh, Sudan, which has got more pyramids uh, than the pyramids in, uh, in Ethiopia. Or whether it is uh, the Great Zimbabwe. We're a very ingenious continent. We're an innovative continent. I mean, how did they build the Great Zimbabwe? How did they build uh, the, the pyramids? That type of continent, with that type of people. I was in Burkina Faso, and you can imagine I'm always uh, doing things. Left is Burkina Faso, right is South Africa. Right, I was just counting all my money. Because, you know, if, um, my, if, if Mayweather can count all his millions, I can count all my kwachas. <laughs> you know, so, so I was counting my kwachas, which all, I'm sure collectively was $100 from every country uh, in the continent. But I was in Burkina Faso, and they were boycotting against the CFR. Because the CFR stands for Colonies of France in Africa. I'm like, I understand. So I joined the, the, the match. I said, we, we don't want colonies of Africa because they've been gone forever. Naturally, all I've done for my life is build brands. 
So if you go, if you go on the Bill Brands, uh, you can see what I've done in the last 10 years. I've been doing surveys across the whole continent, uh, uh, looking at what are the top brands in the continent. And here's the challenge that we have as continent, uh, which brings us to the problem that we have. Only 17% of the brands that Africans admire are African. So it means, as Africans, we reject ourselves. Now, if you reject yourself, you will not buy yourself. You will not celebrate yourself. You will not assert yourself. You will not... Uh, my auntie's name was Ibodu, which means rot. But that's the name that they gave her. And we have to understand why they gave her that name, not run away. I was in Asmara, and I was driving on the highway, and I see the Coca-Cola, uh, the only Coca-Cola billboard. The only Coca-Cola billboard. Asmara is a very clean um, a city, and so is much of, uh, of, of, of Eritrea. But everywhere in the continent, you'll find Coke. Mostly you'll find MTN and you will fly Ethiopia. Our job is to build those brands and our brands to ensure that these brands survive. So what do I take on my journey as I close? When I take on my journey, hey, I've gone through, this year I've gone through two passports, last year maybe two or three. Um, uh, so I've gone about, in the last three years, I've gone about through 10 or so passports. Um, I take the passport, I cross the border, and I leave it at the airport. Because what you must do when you travel, you leave your country at the airport. Because if you come to any country with your country, you are then going to put in post on that country where you come from. You are not going to be able to experience the country. Because they say a man, a wise man travels to discover himself and we will un understand as we travel, you understand that most of the flags go back to Ethiopia as the one country that was never ever, that was never ever uh, colonized. You will understand many countries. So when I was going to that we stopped at the school and the kids were singing, uh, kids were, were, were singing Kosi Sikelele in Kiswahili. And it, it warmed me so much. Continent, we wanted to create a unified continent with a unified agenda to drive our, uh, to drive agenda as, as a continent. So us, South Africa. 75% of Africans require a visa to come to South Africa. I don't need a visa to many countries in the continent. And yet, as from a tourism perspective, and I, say, I tell the minister this, we want to go from 10 million this year, 9 million, to 21, you know, the president spoke at a state of the nation, 21 million. Oh, can't even remember the numbers. Uh, by 2030. I'm like, president, of course, our job is to help you do that. But open up the borders. Make it easy for people to move. 70% of the people who come here are from the continent. Open up the borders. They are not going to live here. They are going to go back. The bad ones will, will find a way here anyway. The good ones are here to come and to go. Don't use the bad experiences of two or three people and then uh, and apply it to the rest of the continent. We have a challenge as Africans because the rest of the, con of the continent, they don't see us as a welcoming country. They don't see us as a country uh, that, is, uh, 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 that is welcoming. So whether I've, whether I've been to the bottom part where the uh, kisses the Atlantic or to the highest point in the continent or to the furthest north part of, the, uh, of, of Africa, The one thing that I've discussed in every single, I've, I've found in every single one of those places is that I am one of them. They are us. So when you reflect on our values as a country, values of determination, I think you saw what Africans can do. If you look at the values of innovation, whether I showed you some of the, ex the excellence that goes across this continent, whether it's a, va a value of diversity or the value of integrity, I paid no bribe to get uh, to, go, to go across uh, uh, to grow borders or cooperation or, the, or Ubuntu. For me to go through all this continent, I needed all those values because those are African values, and that is what carries is going to take this country to the next place. If we are going to get everybody to love this country again. For them to love this country again, we just need to go back to these values and to love these values, not to make them look beautiful on paper, 
Because what we love as South Africans, we love good English, but we have very bad practices. Our job is to love these values every day because otherwise we cannot stand there and claim that we are Africa. Thank you. I was a camera. Uh, before we go to tea, just uh, if you can download the Brand South Africa app, okay? It is available in the iOS and Google stores, and the reason we want you to do that is uh, because uh, we're going to have a panel discussion shortly after this, and we want you to be able to participate in the question and answer session afterwards. So all you have to do once you've downloaded that is create a profile and upload a profile pic so that you can participate in that Q&A a little bit later on. Uh, it's tea time now, and uh, I will call you back in about 15 minutes' time. Thank you.
icon, the brand South Africa um, app that you need to download. It has a yellow icon. Please look out for that. Once you have managed to download the app, um, please make sure that you go to, there's a little icon at the, at the bo on the bottom right-hand corner that says feedback session. And that is where you can go in and you can pose a question, if you like. Uh, you can ask a question there. You're also welcome to go to the icon that says poll, and there you can vote on, on what you felt about the event this morning. All right. So I just want to introduce you to our panel that is taking over from here. Uh, to the right of me, Dr. Pietrus de Kock. He's the General Manager of Research at Brand South Africa, and he's going to moderate this panel discussion for us. He's going to be joined by the following panel, and I'm going to ask you to please come up and take your places on stage as I mention your name. Doug Place, who is the CMO at Nando's. Won't you please come up, Doug? Zanele Morrison the Director of Marketing and Corporate Affairs at the JSE. Hussein Karjika, the CEO of the Mail and Guardian. And Shani Kay, who's Executive Producer and Managing Director of the Mensch Network. Uh, they will now uh, begin their discussion, and shortly after that, we will take about 15 minutes of questions from the floor. Are we good? Good morning, colleagues. Good morning. Honorable Minister, thank you for your opening words and all our colleagues and friends who uh, join us for uh, another Nation Brand Forum discussion. And you know, there's never a dull moment in the Brand South Africa universe, so I'm going to start right here. Give us your quick introduction and who you are and what you bring to us today. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Shani Kay. I'm the executive producer and MD of a small agency called Regency Global. And what we do really is specialize in what we call authentic brand positioning content. So we work with brands to understand and articulate what we call purposeful business and how to use those purposeful business engagements to tell stories that are impactful and meaningful, that help to build brands, to build trust, to build credibility, and to create a virtuous circle of positivity through communications and good business. Um, we work with Brand South Africa on a, a campaign called SA Inc., where we look to tell the stories of corporate-led transformation across industries and sectors across South Africa, and to really bring to life what, uh, you know, the role of business as a national asset is in this country, and creates a, a common and aligned agenda of positive storytelling so that we can move forward into the progress that we all want to see. Brilliant. My name is Hussein Kajika. I'm the chief executive of the Mail and Guardian newspaper. Um, and our paper's been around for the past 34 years and played a very important role in South Africa's democracy. And I think at this point, one has to acknowledge the role that uh, not only the Mail and Guardian, but the role that all media has played in undoing um, the rot that is set into the society over the past 10 years. So, so it's very disappointing um, that uh, media not only in South Africa, but across the world, is facing the kinds of challenges that we're facing right now. Because, you know, without the media and without the journalists and the, the number of, sort of brave journalists that are out there right now, I mean, many ministers, um, and I hope that present company excluded, uh, would tell me that, you know, 10 years ago, they would be, they'd create this narrative in government circles that would say, don't advertise in the Mail and Guardian. They are counter-revolutionary, and all sorts of terms were attributed to us. But um, imagine if we had just glossed over some of these issues, you know, if we had ignored them, some of these very important issues about what is happening in our country. Imagine if we had just glossed over them, the changes that uh, we have seen taking place, especially over the past two years, would just not have been there. Um, so, um, yeah, later on I'd like to talk more about the kinds of roles that I would like to see media play or, or where media can be used to be able to sort of rejuvenate and re-excite the brand um, about South Africa. There, there's lots to be told out there. Um, and good morning. My name is Zanella Morrison, and I'm from the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. And I think the Johannesburg Stock Exchange is, is very well known 
um, to, to basically hold the capital markets and to have a view into governance and regulation and how it affects the capital markets and our policy affects the capital markets. So whilst we are very financially um, strong and astute organization, especially from a regulatory point of view, uh, we are also a, a platform that tells a social story. And every time people come and they march to the, to the, to the, to the exchange, you know, I often say it's, it's often got nothing to do with what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's not our business what they come to march to. But they've got an expectation on, 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 the, on, on, on corporates. They've got an expectation uh, as a society. And I think that there are stories that we need to tell between the partnership between corporates well as as government to say what is it that people are asking for and how are we responding to that and, and I'm hugely enthused um, about the role that we need to play and the shift we need to enable society to make so that we can believe again in South Africa so we can believe in its people so that we can invest and actually also correct some of the social ills um, that people are, are raising and including gender and and I think at the top of that is transformation so I'm going to tell a very interesting uh, story around possibly the imminent or the, the beginning of the transformation of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Okay, we look forward to that. <coughs> Good morning. There we go, li live. Uh, hello, my name is Doug Place. I, uh, I uh, head up marketing for Nando's. Um, I think I'm that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Speaks for itself. Yeah, no, <laughs> there was an interesting Twitter conversation last week of like, show us the picture of the person behind you know, the Twitter feed for now. That's not me. Uh, responsible for what we say on Twitter than uh, than just me, but uh, es essentially, in a you know, in a tweet, uh, I'm part of the 17%. I'm part of uh, a movement which is the small little you know uh, chicken business. It's still small, uh, which has transcended its country of origin, which is here, South Africa, uh, not too far from here, Rosettenville to be precise, uh, and is now present in nearly 30 countries across the world, where we operate restaurants in 24 of them. So. Uh, very aware of the growing Afro-optimism, for lack of a better word, not just here in South Africa, but in, in countries like Saudi Arabia and the UK and you know, the US, uh, where increasingly the African narrative is finding a very potent voice uh, in a time of a fair degree of social unrest. Uh, and so I'm thrilled that you know, this Peri Peri chicken brand gets to be part of a much bigger narrative. Uh, and wow, what a... What a privilege to be here today, gosh. Brilliant, thank you very much. I think um, just for a little bit of context, you know, also to talk about the theme of this year's um, Nation Brand Forum, I'll take you back to the State of the Nation address that the President delivered, I think it was 20th of June. And there's a specific line from the State of the Nation address that we actually took a bit as a baton to think through how do we position the Nation Brand Forum and how does it influence the work of Brand South Africa. So I won't take too long, it's just a few lines. So the President said in State of the Nation, we will make good on our ambition to more than double international tourist arrivals to 21 million. Tebe spoke to that. This will be achieved through the renewal of the country's brand. And that's the statement made in State of the Nation. So that is what inspired us then to say, now how do we respond to that as an organization? It tasked with a major job. If you look at the South African nation brand, a corporate brand, yes, Nando's is massive, JSE is massive, Mail and Guardian, a major brand in the country. But one of the major differences between a corporate and a nation brand is the nation brand goes from the Limpopo River to Cape Point, Indian Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, 57 million people, the most diversified economy on the African continent, and you go on and on and on. So in a way, we manage and create an image of a brand that we have very little control over. And here are some of the people who actually help us build that brand. So the task then that we have on our panel is basically to reflect on one crux question. As partners, as citizens, as corporates, as universities, you name it, how do we ultimately, through what we do, not just be excellent, but how do we utilize those capabilities to build the country? Because ultimately, the JSE, for an example, plays a critical role in a certain area of the image or reputation of the country. Or if a customer goes to a Nando's in another country, they're exposed to not just a brand, they're also exposed indirectly to a country. I think uh, it was about two years ago at the forum we focused on the country of origin effect, you know, and how that influences our brands when they internationalize, when they go into other markets. So my first question that I'm going to have for the panel, and this is maybe a bit of a long-winded one, but I want us to talk about that for a few minutes, 
in your particular area of work or your industry? How, if at all, does the reputation profile of the country impact on what you do? Just talk to us about your experience, anecdotes, or if you have something else that comes to mind, and I'll start right here on my left. Okay, thank you. So I think that the nation brand is very much the overarching lens with which we perceive and engage with everything. So in the work that I do, I have the privilege and the honor to work with companies to unlock their best stories, to tell their best selves, you know. And, and we meet people whose authentic journeys, you know, deliver this, this beautiful story. Um, but of course, you get the cynics. So you get those people who look at this content and respond by being inspired, by talking about it, by sharing about it, by wanting to get involved and know more. And then you get the ones who are jaded by all of the problems and the challenges that are happening by this sort of ill perception of the nation brand and then the cynical kind of response to mm -hmm. that content. So even though it's real and it's authentic, we can't see it for what it is because we're so obscured by everything else that's going on. And that is a reality. We really have to change it. Um, I think, you know, there's so many stories. I've worked with companies across industries and sectors, you know, 40 companies bringing their stories to life. And... And, and there's wonderful things to celebrate, and we need to start talking about them. Um, my colleague at, at Business Leadership South Africa, Busi, she said something re that really stuck with me the other day. She said, you don't succeed by focusing on your weaknesses. Mm. You succeed by focusing on your strengths. Um, so I think we need to more talk about them. Yes, we need strategies. We need implementation plans. We need to deal with the problems. Mm. But we need to talk about the good mm. stuff. We need to talk about it more. We need to believe in it. And we need to create the energy that will kind of move us into that spreading and, and widening for yeah. all of us. I want to jump to the Mail and Guardian. I think what you just said now is an interesting opening to something you hinted at in your opening statement. You know, South Africa, I think, if I am correct, we rank 38th in the world for press freedom, in the press freedom index. So we're not doing very badly in terms of that. As a democratic mm -hmm. society, I think the one thing that we have embraced as South Africans post-1994, coming from an authoritarian uh, system that suppressed any opinion that was not in line with its philosophy, um, the role of the press then in a free society, but keeping this kind of sentiment in mind. Because sometimes when one looks at headlines, when one looks at some of the revelations, you would swear the press is not of this country. How do we strike that balance? Um, I think at the outset, one has to be grateful to the role that activists such as the Honorable Minister has played in the turn of the democracy was, uh, was press freedom. Um, and, and we, uh, as a media, um, uh, are able to operate in an environment uh, where we do not have to worry about censorship as much as uh, happens you know, elsewhere across the continent, for example. But um, the foundation of the Mail and Guardian is built on um, issues of uh, the foundations of integrity, of credibility, of authenticity in our brands. And that is not always sexy, right? Um, and I think that the role that we see ourselves as playing is being able to create platforms for uh, issues to be dissected um, discussed um, so that, uh, you know, the real issues then are able to emerge so that uh, policy makers, decision makers can then understand and grapple these issues a lot better and make far more informed decisions, you know, based on the input that we have from uh, across society. And I think I always use the example, um, you know, two or three years ago when we speak about the, the poor um, standards of education in, in South Africa, you know, and our, and, our, and our policies. And, you know, what the MP does allow for is for people that operate behind the scenes within the ministries to come out and um, state their views. And there's so much depth of knowledge and thinking going into these issues that we often do not see come out on the front pages of our newspapers, because often what we see on the front pages is what the minister has said or you know, what, what, what government has, has come out. But there, there is, and I think that is quite um, uh, gratifying and it creates a lot of optimism that there is so much depth in the thinking going, going on behind the scenes. And it's, it's, a, it's a, how we then you know, extract that and bring that up to the front pages of, of, of the paper. I mean, what creates the challenge on the other side is the fact that 
because uh, there's been dwindling commercial support for print, um, and, and, and that's based on another issue with the sort of migration from uh, print into uh, digital um, type of uh, consumer behavior for, for media, um, it creates challenges. And one is not able to invest in, in you know, high standards of, uh, of journalism. quality journalism comes through. So that is a challenge that we're trying to believe that um, how that could be uh, helped and, and could be resolved is if we engage corporates to really understand the importance of the role that media has played over the past 10 or 20 years in this country and the role that it will play in the future and ensure and encourage corporates to reinvest back in to media, not only print, into digital platforms as well, because right now, corporates are spending the, the marketing spend on, on Facebook and on Google, and you know, those revenues are just leaving the country. Yeah. So, so those are the challenges that um, media organizations, not just ourselves, but across the country, across the world, are facing right now, and these are the issues that we need to grapple with and to um, try and find a, a new commercial model going forward. But we do... JSE, I think if I'm, I stand to be corrected, currently 19th in the world by market capitalization. Yeah. So we sit with a tremendous powerhouse just up the road here. Now, coming to my question, have you had any experience in the w business of the JSE um, where an Im the image of the country, does that impact on your work? To our business. Because as the exchange, we attract foreign and local investment, but the foreign investment is just as important, uh, and if not more so. So we're constantly going on roadshows, engaging with um, you know, financial institutions across the world. We're in New York now in November. We're doing London and China next, next year. And, and we have to build the go out and they have conversations. Um, what we're constantly hearing back is that the world wants to see policy certainty. They want to see a government that's stable, that produces results consistently over time. They want to see that our regulations actually work. They want to see accountability for when things don't work. So, so their view of our brand at its core when it comes to investing is in the, in the nature of our institutions. Our SOEs are a huge question now. The stability of our SOEs, where are they going? So now we have to go answer those questions. What's happening with ESCOM? What's happening with SA? Hey, what's happening? All of them. People want to, you know, the, the, the International uh, Forum wants to understand where do we stand. I think that Cyril has a, a honorable president, has a very tough task ahead of him. Um, he, he, he's, he's inherited a country that, ha that is Zuma, and during Zuma's time, I think that we really had a turbulent market at that point. Globally is when we actually started to see um, a world that was not as favorable as it was during Thabo Mbeki or Nelson Mandela's time. Uh, you know, so, so whilst we had the reconciliation, we had the crafting of the policy, Cyril now has to try and turn the ship, and, and, very, and to turn the ship again and to give confidence is not an easy thing. So we, we really are wishing for bigger strides, bigger steps, b bigger... Um, you know, actions that demonstrate that we actually want to invest in this country, not in a small way and not through just small actions, but in actually a, a few leaps, you know, that are going to bring back the, the belief in South Africa as a brand to invest in. Nando's, I'm going to ask the question with a different angle to you. So the reputation of the country and humor, because Nando's, the one thing that you are known for is exactly that. <laughs> so what do we do with humor as Brand South Africa? Yeah, absolutely. I think, and it's, fact, it's fairly consistent with what we've heard you know, from JC and as well as Mail and Guardian, is that you've got to tell the truth. You know, at the fundamentally, a brand promise has to be believable. Uh, and a lot of advertising, uh, it, it represents an ideal, but not necessarily the actual thing as a business if we didn't have the best tasting chicken, for example. Uh, so fundamentally, uh, when we have advertising, uh, and this is a common misnomer actually for, for us, it's a question we get asked regularly is, you know, why do you enjoy controversial advertising? And I, I'm not sure we've made a controversial advert in a decade. Certainly we haven't had any ads banned in a very long time. Other brands have had their ads banned. 
Uh, and mostly what we do is listen. And when we get it right, and we don't always, believe me, um, we just play back the narrative that most South Africans are hearing. And so what we're looking for is where is their consensus? And, uh, and if we can play that back creatively in a way that makes people go, yep, ain't that so, or you know, isn't that true, you build a sense of trust that you know, we're in this together. Uh, and if you acknowledge that the, you know, fundamentally there's a certain truth about the situation, and truth that we're all really hopeful for the World Cup final next weekend, uh, but we're also, you know, we have to agree that the state of our economy isn't as good or as inclusive as it could be. Uh, and that, you know, things are not as safe as they should be for lots of really vulnerable people. So you've got to be able to tell the truth, not just when it suits you, because we really want to lift the Web Ellis Trophy again, but you've got to be able to tell the truth and speak truth to all sorts of power, not just, you know, government sector, but private sector as well, and, uh, you know, celebrity culture and the likes that go with it. Uh, and if you do that, because there's believability, it allows people through humor, and, and that's because humor is not necessarily confrontational, uh, it allows us to laugh at the same things so that we can be sad about the same things, we can be hopeful about the same things, because we speak truth about the same things. I don't know if that mm, makes sense. sense. Makes mm. sense. That brings me to one of the, the things that was introduced earlier is the, the pledge war. So here's a question to each one of you. Now, from your realms of activity, as Brand South Africa, we cannot do our work if it's not with partnerships. It's impossible. We're an organization of how much our headcount now, 55 or so. So we're a very small organization by numbers and also by budget. So a lot of the work we do rely on partnerships. So some thoughts from your industries or your sector, you can think a bit broader. If you were to advise the newly appointed board of trustees of Brand South Africa, new types of partnerships, new types of things we need to be thinking of, and there's a reason for me asking the question in this way. If we look at... ...interesting, fascinating changes in mindsets, behaviors, etc. Now, keeping all of that in mind, how do we work together? How do we partner not just to do the blowing up of balloons, but get a substantive message of a country and a society grappling with transformation issues, being honest about that, but the partnerships we need to realize the long-term vision that we have of an integrated, developed, humane society. Share your thoughts with us. And what do you pledge, by the way? <laughs> I think I'm one step ahead of the pledge, fortunately for me. I mean, we found in Brand South Africa partner last year when we started this journey of SA Inc. So we're already sharing content and helping to bring to life the stories of what responsible, profitable South African business looks like when Brand South Africa will be taking that content and sharing it with the world and putting out that message to the global business community to say, actually, South Africa is open for business. And not only are we open for business, we have our finger on the triple bottom line. We're aware of environment, society, and profitability all at the same time, and this is what it looks like. Um, and so the more that we produce that content, the more we're going to share it and the more it's going to go out there. So we want to get that groundswell and that network effect of getting the content out as far and wide as possible. But I think beyond that, with social media and digital, the digital world and the way that we can tap in and target different groups with different messaging, there's this massive opportunity to drive a content agenda that really is directed at doing just that. And I think Brand South Africa is in this unique position to create the platforms and you know the environments to do that. So are we setting up competitions where we want the general public to come in with a bit of a brief around content, storytelling, stuff that actually is, is, is driving the narrative that we want? And we can put out a different message to business and we can put out a different message to government, but we can do a call to action across various sectors of society with drawing in this content that we want that we think will actually drive what we need as a South African brand. And I think just to speak to that, I was very heartened to look at the research paper and see that the majority of people that were profiled saw themselves as South African mm. first. And I think that that's probably something quite new and something that gives me a lot of hope because what we really need is a unified South African brand. And what does that stand for and how do we build out the diversity of that brand from that point? And if we can start to articulate that and bring together all the perspectives that actually represent that, then I think we'll be on the right track. Mm -hmm. 
from the media side? How do we partner? I mean, my, my suggestion to Brand South Africa would be to engage far more extensively with the youth of South Africa. Um, the problems uh, or the future of South Africa over the next 20 years are not going to be solved by the individuals over the age of 35. And I mean, no disrespect to anybody who is, I, I'm, I'm well over 35. So, so, so we, we are there to be mentors and, and, and we can provide guidance. But if you really want to engage with um, the youth um, of South Africa, uh, for example, the, the Mail and Guardian has annually hosts what we call the Mail and Guardian 200 Young South Africans. And this year we had 6,000 nominations, right? That had been submitted. And out of the 6,000, we were able to sort of um, uh, whittle down to 200 young individuals under the age of 35 who have made a significant impact in the sector within which they operate. And it is phenomenal to see the number, for example, of female engineers that are emerging that are attaining good roles, you know, uh, within the uh, SEOs the, um, uh, and, and, and the, the, the sort of uh, infrastructure development programs across the country. And that is very encouraging for us. And the more we engage with the thoughts of these young individuals um, in, in sort of determining their own future or the way they see South Africa going over the next um, 20 or 30 years, the more we are able to then make some significant and, and uh, impactful um, decisions about you know, where we position um, and how we determine policy for the future. I mean, I think that um, uh, the, the engagement with them has been very useful for them. Again, we're utilizing and we continue to utilize the platform and our pledge is, you know, in future to bring um, uh, business uh, in South Africa on board, uh, brand SA on board, and to um, to individuals with you so that you could learn and engage with them, learn from them, to see what ideas they have about um, the future uh, of, of this country. Jay-Z, I've got another angle on mm, the same question. I was prepared for this angle. <laughs> yes, in the, in the, no, no, the same question, same oh, question, okay. just a slightly different angle. None of my prep is, is, is coming up and I'm really getting frustrated. <laughs> it's like pages. Uh, no, it's just the angle of the credit rating situation. In the last... point of view, you know, I'm sure that also affects the work of the JSE. So, partnering, how do we work together in that kind of financial world space, but at the same time, how do we deal with some of the threats that are coming through in terms of constantly pushing the image or the picture that there's a country, the, an economy teetering on the edge of downgrade, how do we deal with that? You know, I think a key that has to be unlocked is, is, is actually corporate South Africa. I think Brand SA has really got to start working the corporate market. If I look at BLSA, and we are part of BLSA, and, and it's a platform where all the CEOs are sitting, it is so critical that, one, we start with the transformation of, of, of corporates in South Africa, because transformation leads to diversity that, is, that, that grows industry, that grows businesses. Um, it, it's for more transparency, for more regulatory security. You know, so, so I think brand essay, as much as we do the storytelling, there's, a, there's a, a narrative and a story that's happening inside corporate that we are not yet telling the truth about. All of us that are employed in corporates, and, and I think as a black woman, there's also a sense of fatigue, and I'm sure some are struggling with a sense of fear. Um, I don't know what our struggles are, but the truth needs to start being told about how corporates are running their entities and how they're enabling society. So for me, that's the angle that, that, that I think we really need to lean into. We have a new CEO, um, Leila Foree, and I had the pleasure of meeting her just before we started, and she was living in Australia. So obviously the, the usual narratives go on in your head. Oh, she left the country, she's in Australia, you know, she's coming back. And she asked me, what do I think about transformation? You know, um, you know how do I want to see it happening? And I, and I just thought to myself, I'm not going to have this conversation with you because I've been having this conversation for a very long time. You know, so you can have your interpretation, I'll keep mine. 
And she said to me, and she surprised me, she said, having left the country and of being in Australia, I'm only coming back for transformation because now, like never before, have I understood the role and the impact that I can make as a CEO of a South African corporate. So I'm not saying all the CEOs should go live in Australia and get a good sense of what it's like not to be. So I think it would help. I think it would help. So if they want to leave, they must leave. But, but they need to come back and understand they have such a big responsibility in this country. And that responsibility is ultimately what makes us as a country look good, look good to invest in and look to be, uh, you know, to, to have the credibility we actually need. But I also wanted to lean into Hussein and, and what he said a little bit around we also not having the right kind of coverage. We really, um, we, we, we've, we've, un we've taken out the plug on the, on the people that tell the narrative to the world. And I think the media industry is really struggling. Um, and, and not struggling, struggling to, be, to have the, the resources to tell the stories and to tell the right stories, to hold us accountable and to create transparency. And instead, we've got silly media, you know, saying things that, um, that really don't do, a, you know, it, it, that don't do well on the brand of South Africa because it ultimately is what people actually see. So we might enjoy talking about people's lives, um, it, you know, that we should have no interest in and they themselves should not be doing that, but that's just me saying it and they, they're welcome to do what they want. But, but the fact that our media leans to such fickle journalism is really destroying, I think, for me, the way in which we are perceived as a country. So I do, and I agree with you, we need to reinvest so that the right stories are told. And from Nando's, how do we get some of that great chicken humor into our brand? Um, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. I think it, all brands, all strong brands, are fundamentally built on two things. You know, what makes you different and what makes you better? And you have to have both. I think Brian South Africa has a very firm understanding of what makes us different. But you know, frankly, if we're going to be even remotely attractive to foreign investment or local investment or transformation for that matter, it has to be well understood and well articulated that it has to also fundamentally make us better. Which means you have to decide uh, you know, who you are in the world. What you're not going to do. And I think it's very easy and very and it's the unity in that diversity. The miracle. I mean, we have every reason not to believe in this. Uh, and if you see, you know, increasing you know, sliding back into factionalism and, and, and othering, and it's always them. Uh, to our constitution starts with we the people, not them the people. Mm -hmm. uh, it's we the people. And so you've got to look for where is the, the unity within the constraints of diversity? How does that give us a point of difference in the world? And I mean, not just the world beyond, uh, you know, the passport borders, mm -hmm. Tebe took us through earlier, but the world that we live in each and every single day. And how do you then, only then can you, you know, create uh, communications or advertising or promotions or competitions, whatever it is, based on those points of difference and advantage. If you don't do that, on the surface looks good and you know, it has good sentiment, and I'm sure we'd all like to paint the flag in our faces and sing Kumbaya. But for many South Africans, that's just not the truth of their day-to-day -day reality. So if we represent only the ideal and not necessarily the truth, and also not just you know, the truth, but also what makes us competitive, what will make us increasingly competitive in a fractious and difficult world, then you, then you have a brand. Then you have something that you can get people behind. And it's very specific because it gives you a point of view and a point of view of what you're not. You, know, you make me think, um, Minister, just last week I presented to the National Planning Commission on a discussion on social cohesion, and as I was leaving the union buildings, the thought struck me, you know that South Africa is an incredibly unique country, that I think we're one of the few places where we actually still have these kind of conversations. In a world of, if you look at po a post-Cold War dynamic in the world, conflicts are driven by identity. From one religion, you find tremendous difference and conflict. 
from language, from orientation, etc., etc. And the reason I mention that is I think that is something we must really nurture in South Africa. There's an index called the Ibrahim Index of African Governance where we rank first on the continent for protection against religious and ethnic discrimination, for example. And no, we're not in utopia as a country. However, I think that is a very interesting basis for us to work from. I want to also perhaps lean into to, to what you're saying. Do we also not need to start seeing ourselves as Africans, not just South Africans? I think... I Externally, they do see us as an Africa, but we see ourselves as separate to the continent in how we speak and how we engage and how we, how we sell ourselves. And I think for me, it's something that I'd like to, to throw out and say our pride does begin first and foremost mm -hmm. in being an African. It's now further expanded than what it used to be during the days of apartheid, where we were actually governed by a South African system that constrained us. There's a broader and a much bigger opportunity for us to embrace being Africans first and then seeing ourselves as a South Africa. Very sad in there. I think what we also need to do is disabuse ourselves of this notion that we are better than everybody else. Because that is really what has happened over the past 20 or 30 or 40 years. Is that, and, and, and actually we are perceived as such by our brothers across the continent. We are perceived as to be the Australia of, these, uh, of the Africa continent, right? Um, and we believe that we ought to go out there and teach them and train them and, uh, you know, this big gateway. We've got, we've got to get rid of this notion. We've got to see ourselves as part of the, uh, of the group. You know, we, we have our strengths. And so do our brothers in Nigeria and Rwanda. And we can learn from each other as opposed to sitting here with our big egos. Uh, they say South Africans are very well-balanced individuals. You know, they have... Uh, Chips on both shoulders, right? <laughs> um, so um, I, th I think it's something we've got to just try, try and sit back and understand exactly the dynamics where South Africa fits in, as opposed to seeing South Africa as being the leader of what is happening across the continent. So that's very important. Thanks. Mm. Thought? I think. You know, I think that there's a, a level of complexity in South Africa that doesn't really exist anywhere else in the world, and in, that can be problematic, but it also defines our uniqueness. Um, and, and I think it is exactly what all of you say. We need to see ourselves as African, and we need to embrace what's amazing about other parts of Africa that we can learn from, but we also need to balance that with celebrating and, and exploring what makes us unique. And that combination, I think, will really set us in, in fantastic stead. But I think... That complexity also speaks to how wounded we are as a people and the kind of the duality that we have between feeling South African and that's our culture and then feeling all of these differences and seeing everything that happens around us. And we only have to look at all the xenophobia and the stuff um, that's going on to see how insular we are in, in certain ways, um, but also how worldly we are in others. And so I think we've got a lot of work to do and a lot of healing to do. But as I said, I think that cultural South Africanness is a wonderful starting point. And if we can use that to springboard ourselves into being African, I certainly feel African. I, I, you know, at my, in my soul, I left the country and came back because I, I feel African. Um, and we need to nurture that in whatever way possible. I think we can open to questions or comments from the floor. I think while we organize our mics, maybe just a quick thought on this. We do quite extensive uh, surveys in the country. And from the identity point of view, what is heartening to see when we ask South Africans, how do you identify yourself? Exactly the same percentage would say, I identify myself as a South African and an African first. So we've got ground there. We've got grounds from an identity point of view. But I do agree in terms of our broader orientation, you know, we really need to understand our rootedness on this continent and kind of get rid of a bit of the exceptionalism that sometimes comes with it. Do we have takers for comments or questions from the floor? on now? Um, question and tell us which panelist it's for, please. Thank you. Okay. Um, good morning. Uh, my, my name is Tony Nkadimeng. I'm from South African Tourism. 
Mine is not really a question. I think it's more of a comment. Um, you know, just to borrow, just the last point on cohesion. I think for me, um, as a country, and I think also uh, leaning back onto the Million Guardian is that we have given to the, um, if I may put it, we've given, we have actually given the voice to more politi politics and other things rather than the actual communities. How do we, you know, build 58 million ambassadors for our country? We have failed on that. And as a result, obviously, the narrative that has been there is the negative narrative that is spread around the social media. So we need to revisit how we give voice to the community ambassadors. Because remember, it starts at home. You know, when you, I mean, as, as, as tourism, we go around the world spreading the voice about the visit, people visiting. But we, we, we need to start by cleaning our, our yard first. You know, when you get in visitors, you do the spring cleaning. So that spring cleaning, we haven't really done proper in terms of giving the voice to those people who are supposed to tell the stories of South Africa to the, to the, to the global uh, visitors, including local visitors. So, and there's so many beautiful stories, uh, unfortunately. Now, the, the, the other comment that I wanted to build on this is that we have so many beautiful assets as a country, you know, be it from a natural beauty and all that for our country. But most importantly, the platforms that we have, it's been 25 years now. And I think we need to start doing things different to build cohesion. Why I'm saying that? We have national days, colleagues from Youth Day to Women's Day to all of those. There's a stadium, there's speech. And I think we need to move from there because it's 25 years. How do we build cohesion? Because one of the population that are either attending that particular event what about that cohesion? We need to start doing things differently. And a quick example on youth, for instance. Why don't we let the youth to take charge of Youth Month? You know, by giving them the platform, but rather let them, say, let them tell us how they want to celebrate the Youth Month in creating their, you know, it's, it's their space. So I thought, let me just bring that to, to look deeply onto the platforms that we have in terms of building those story, storytelling moments. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Would anyone like to add to that? I, I just want to say that uh, SA Tourism runs a uh, project called the Lily Zella Awards. I'm not sure whether it's happened yet or it's going to be happening pretty soon. But uh, if one attends those awards, one understands. Uh, from a tourism perspective and what people um, and entrepreneurs are doing out there in their environments to create um, areas uh, uh, that would welcome tourists, you know, into the, into the areas. It, it, it's quite phenomenal. I mean, I think that the MNG will be running some content from the Lily Zell Awards when it does happen in a few weeks' time. But I do encourage all of you to read just to understand. Um, a question from... Mm -hmm. oh, there we go. Hello. Hi, um, my name is Sindim Koteni, and I'm an entrepreneur in the ICT space, and my question is directed to um, Mrs. Zanele. What's your surname? Okay, so particularly in regards to investor confidence, there's constant policy changes within the ICT space, particularly the spectrum issue. So my question is, JSE listed companies have a huge role to play in ensuring that CEOs or C-suite executives JSE take the initiative to try to understand the perception of top listed companies in the country, with particularly on the changes that rapidly change within policy. And I'm, I say this because if the perception is not monitored, the repercussions could either be favorable or none. 
And if we do not respond to what the perceptions are in activities, then we're obviously not going to um, ensure that the economy is constantly stimulated. Thank you. Thank you so much. The surname is Morrison. I leaned on the Klosa side. You know I'm a Klosa with their English surnames. I don't know where they got it. Um, but somewhere along I could just pick it and use it. I think you're asking a very, a very difficult question to a point where we've actually even stopped um, trying to engage on, on the question of, of the spectrum. It becomes a sore point, and I think corporate, and, 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 and in our discussion and having engagements with corporate, corporate is feeling a little bit um, exhausted from actually trying to, to do their business whilst managing the constant uh, policy uncertainty. And also we have a very short cycle of turnover of people. So the minute that you feel secure, the next thing you know there are new people in leadership positions and policies are changing again. Now corporate can't control those. Um, they are actually, they are receivers of policy. And there, there is, I must actually share, I think, looking at when we're trying to organize for, for SA Tomorrow in New York, where we're taking South African CEOs, there's a little bit of, 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 of fatigue on the side of corporates. And, and today's government is leaning heavily on corporates to say, we cannot make this change without you. We have to partner. So the president is doing a lot of work to say consistency going forward is based on you know, private and public sector partnership. But I'm, I'm confessing that I think corporate is, is a little bit tired. So I think the work is quite huge in bringing back um, the energy to want to actually participate because the sentiment at the moment is stuck and it's not actually going to get better. And I'm not sure... I want to put my foot in and do what I need to do in order to improve on sentiment. I don't have a positive answer um, for your question. Right, uh, we have a question here. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Naeem Sirat. I'm the CEO of communications at Publicis Group Africa. Um, thank you really for sharing some amazing thoughts this morning. And it really is a reflection of, I think, what is a superpower of us as South Africans is that we've got visionary leadership. We've got vision. We're able to think big in our country. Um, it's also our biggest weakness because we think big and then we want to act big as well. We've got these big plans. We want to execute big. Um, and any thoughts to how we start to act smaller, how we start to take smaller, more incremental steps towards achieving these big ideals so that these don't just remain big visions, big plans, but we start to move towards them in smaller What's our goals? Who, who are you to answer your question? I, um, I, mean, I, I think that the criticism I had of the National Development Plan um, was that there was not enough engagement with corporate South Africa at the time because I had a thought, and I'm not sure if there's a version 2.0 of it, but every, if, if there's buying from corporate SA in the greater objective, then every JSC chief exec ought to have the National Development Plan as a handbook that helps them guide sort of certain decisions that they're making across all sectors, whether it's in ICT, whether it is in um, uh, mining, you know, whatever the sector is. But then there is a... Um, ...taken at a corporate level do speak to a bigger plan. And, I, and, and that, that may be a very small step to take, I think, to try and ensure and to gauge whether there is the appetite for corporate South Africa to now revisit engagement with the National Development Plan or the new one if, or new version of it if there is one. And then there is buy-in, you know, and then there's a, a, a sense of uh, unity in purpose in trying to achieve some of the objectives. I mean, I have a great suggestion. Instead of marching to the JSC, we need to march to all the CEOs you know, and hand over the national development plan instead of actually handing over petitions that nobody actually follows up on. So, I mean, something simple, small. I mean, we, we're good enough here. We can carry the national development, you know, and just to every single CEO. Say, Are you putting this in your strategy to what degree? But on a serious note, that wasn't serious. On a serious note, and it, it is actually a good idea. But on a serious note, I, I think... <laughs> okay, back to the question. 
honestly, I, we, 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 for example, have got um, an investment challenge. And I've come across a number of people who've, who's, who have, um, are working in the financial services sector, and they were part of the investment challenge 15 years ago. Um, it, talked, it, it reaches about, you know, about 20,000 students every year. We get a couple of winners. But, the, but a young person in any rural area anywhere in South Africa who's part of the investment challenge gets access to every single corporate and understands how those corporates are performing, what they are doing. We give them virtual money to invest. We teach them about investing. And when I arrived at the JSC, I thought to myself, if every single household can be empowered to understand and talk about money, how do we invest, how to grow their legacies, I think we would change the narrative for the future of South African young, pe young people today, but the future adult of tomorrow. So for me, that, that's around inclusion including every single sector in our businesses and making sure that when we are giving away transformation money, we're not doing it as a by the by where we just hand it out, but it is an, a concerted effort to uplifting the most marginalized in our society. That is not a big ask. Investing in entrepreneurs, SMMEs, in your business, it's not a small ask. And every single one of us can make choices with the money that we have, the budgets that we have, who do we use, who do we empower, and how do we go about doing it. And I can be honest with you, we're not doing a good job of that. Yeah. But that for me is a small step. Can I jump in with mm -hmm. a quick comment? I think, um, you know, I work with global business as well, and what happens there is that more and more companies are mapping what they do to the sustainable development goals and the targets within the goals and reporting on that basis. And maybe there's a way in which the come, you know, be nailed down into a framework that allows or compels corporates to actually deliver um, information and, and strategic business based on delivery of what's in that N NDP and in alignment with it. And we can kind of then draw it all, all together from there. I think just to comment on your point of the corporates and the, I think we, we turn to corporate a lot and I work with corporates and I think they have a massive role to play, but I think the most massive role they have to play is in enabling small business to flourish. You know, that's where the jobs are going to come, that's where the economic growth is going to come, and that's where they need to make their biggest contribution in, in bringing them into their value chains and building them up and growing them. And those are also the stories that will help them build their own brands going forward. So there really can be this virtuous as a good starting point towards that. Before we take uh, the next question, we haven't had too many questions from the app. Uh, I'd love you to make use of the app and also to just uh, give us a vote on the poll, please, as to how you feel about the, uh, the gathering. Uh, so we have a question here. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. My name is Ntavi Singh. I wear two hats, but I'm asking this question strong comment in my capacity as chairperson of the board of the South African Electro Technical Council, which is a partnership between the electro technical sector and the DTI to try and promote as much exports as possible out of South Africa. And this membership of this uh, organization has got big uh, corporates or conglomerates, if you may call that, and small business entrepreneurs. I think the young lady over there, a small entrepreneur in the IT sector could become our member and you'll benefit a lot. But my question goes to, um, it's actually a comment stroke uh, question. The lady over here spoke about SA Inc. Who is SA Inc? And, and maybe I need to be educated because I see Brand South Africa dealing more with more FMCG inclined kind of companies. I don't see a lot of corporates. Uh, a lady from the JSE, Zanele, you spoke about uh, what needs to happen with corporates and how Brand SA could assist in terms of putting corporates together. And for them, the comment that you made earlier on about Brand South Africa, I echo your sentiments 101%. I actually said, give that to Mena Bell. What is that of working in Southern Africa, Southern and Central Africa? We go out there as, as an association trying to, to, to get work for our members in um, a power project or a rail project. And we find that we sit around the table with governments of those uh, parts of the, of, the, of the continent. And as soon as we finish our meeting, another group of corporates from South Africa arrives. And we once got a comment from, from I'm sitting next to the CEO of this association. We want uh, Kenya, he said to us, Kenyan tea is very lovely. We welcome you, South Africans. Throughout the day, I stopped doing my work. 
sit with four or five of your, 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 your delegation coming to talk to us, but we never see anything happen. The reason why things are like that is because we don't really have a real SA Inc. From our side, we think we have got SA Inc. And you spoke about SA Inc. And I'm asking myself, which one is really the SA Inc.? The DTI has formed a, 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 a desk called Invest South Africa. It's got an Africa wing and a, and a European wing. They are assisting us to actually try and open doors into the continent for big projects that are actually going to assist in improving the economy of the country. It would be lovely to see Brand South Africa assisting or, or, or going forward with us in terms of those kind of missions to really hoist the flag and show the rightful uh, side of Brand South Africa. It's well and good. I can see you doing a lot of good work with um, what you currently are doing. But can you please try and get, I almost said the real SA Inc., most of SA Inc. on board to, to, to hoist the South African flag? Right, so, so better representation, Shani? Yeah, I think that that's a really great point. Um, SA Inc. started off as a almost piggyback on this idea of South Africa Incorporated, and, and we started off looking at telling the stories of business in South Africa, and those generally relate to bigger corporates simply because they are probably the ones who have money to invest in such a, a sort of brand-building initiative. Um, it's... It, it evolved from there to become what we think of as SA inclusive. And, and that's because the stories that are being shared are across the board. And what we've been fortunate to be able to do is profile some of the smaller entrepreneurs that have been able to grow really strong and sustainable businesses as part of these corporate value chains. And that's where the stories have been pegged. But yeah, I think those, the, that those SME stories are, are fundamentally missing. And those are really important. And, and unlocking money to be able to bring those stories together and bring them to life and share them more widely, I think would do a tremendous amount for, for the cause and for the initiative. Um, so maybe we can have a chat afterwards and see how we can look at, at, at trying to further that objective. Right. Uh, here we have another question. Yes, ma'am. Um, good, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Jackie Pondo Hendricks. Um, I'm the president of the Johannesburg Chamber of Commerce. I trade and investment into South Africa. And uh, uh, for me, my recent uh, visit to China opened up my eyes uh, to quite a number of things. And I think what I'd like to challenge uh, today's uh, engagement is to please come up with a singular positioning statement for our country. What I found in China was that you ask one question to 20 different Chinese from all different spectrums of life, and they'll give you the same answer. Can we please just get that positioning statement? I would also like to appeal that we look at broader stakeholder engagement, and I know that a lot of this gets said, but a lot of it does not happen. Yeah? Uh, because for me, it's about sustainable stakeholder engagement and understanding exactly who plays what role and responsibility. For example, the lady that mentioned issues around SMMEs, I got this invitation by default. And I am thinking to myself, Johannesburg Chamber of Commerce has been in existence for 129 years, is affiliated to 14,000 chambers around the world, sits on the International Chamber of Commerce, and advises and informs all trade globally. So I then beg the question, how am I then a gatecrasher at such an event? Over and above that, especially from an SMME perspective, we would like to also see from a market segmentation view how we deal with the different market segments and how we tailor make specific communications that can begin to inspire a new narrative in South Africa. And in that market segmentation is international investors. 
I, I host between three and five incoming international uh, delegations per month. And sometimes I am stuck. I'm, I must be honest. I am stuck because I try to find a story in South Africa. And every time I get bombarded with the real issues that are reflected in the media. And for me, that we need to start uh, reducing all these talk shows identifying the issues and finding some tangible, measurable ways of intervention because we need that now as a country. So let's stop talking and let's act. So brand essay, the ball is in your court knowing that you have our support as business uh, at large. I just want to draw attention to your first question there, the issue of positioning South Africa, one positioning statement. Doug, if you had to come up with that... ...there has to be a point of difference and a point of advantage, and there's got to be singularity to that. And that can be really difficult if you try and include everything. So it doesn't make you unconstitutional or it doesn't make you wrong if your intention, you know, I'm sorry to disappoint everyone, but you know, Nando's is unlikely to launch a pizza. Very, very clear about what it is they do, um, you know, the Chinese are very clear about what it is they stand for in the world. Uh, so that when they get into trade disputes, it's very clear as so to why they're getting into trade dispute and what, what it is that they're fundamentally better at than other countries, which is mostly manufacturing. Now, if a chicken seller can understand that from you know, a far degree of distance from the, the realities of day-to-day -day trade conversations with a place like China where Nando's has no presence, then how much more could a, a truly thrilling and exciting country like this one, which has enormous potential, uh, to galvanize that around a singular identity, it, it can't be that difficult. Um, but it is going to require some robust negotiations and, and conversations. But you know what? We, we are where we are because we've been successful in negotiating across differences and across time and across cultures. Uh, and if we can preserve that which makes us us in doing that, every chance of success. I'm really, I'm really optimistic about that. Can I add a quick point on that? Yes, Shoni. A lot of the work... Some of the work we do with companies is to identify and articulate a purpose. Um, and that seems like quite a simple thing, but actually it's quite a robust process of interrogation to kind of get to, you know, what's your North Star? Why do you actually exist? And obviously that's a lot more complex when you come to a country level than it is at a, at a company level with a specific business model. Um, but I think it is that, you know, why do we exist? What's our, what's our reason for being as South Africa? And can we use to move forward as, as that, because there's so many things that we want to bring into this, this positioning statement, which I think would be a wonderful thing, and, and maybe to start thinking about what our purpose is as a country, um, to create an environment that's inclusive for everybody, or there's a lot of work that would have to go into nailing it down into something, so it could be a good point to start. Uh, do we have one last question in that corner? Yes. Um, my name is Adrian Harris, and some of you will know me as the flag lady, the strange one who's actually producing a book on the history of the South African flag in time for Freedom Day next year, fantastically with the support of Brand South Africa. In my real life, I'm actually a rural economic development specialist in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, some of you probably don't know me. I've been mainly working in post-conflict countries um, in the region. I'm also, though, an SME myself. I'm a very small business, and then I go and I consult to large organizations that aren't God, who repeat, uh, who, those who didn't see the uh, story, um, to repeat what the World Bank was referred to um, by our ex-Speaker of Parliament. So I work for the likes of the World Bank, the International Donor Organization.
I firstly have a, a challenge, Zanelle. There was a CEO challenge a few years ago, which was to bring attention to homeless people. And all the CEOs went and they spent a night on the street and it was quite a lot of fun, I believe. Um, but they got a feel and some smuggled hot chocolate and whatever. I have a different challenge. Come walk in our shoes. Shadow a small business for a week. Come stay at our house, drive in our messed up car, look at the bank accounts. You will understand what small business is about. The other thing, just very quick, stakeholders. I think we overestimate the um, technology and the connectivity of social media. I was chatting to a guy at, at my local garage. He's not on Twitter, but we landed up talking about what is investor confidence. Because I said I was, com I was coming to this meeting. And Twitter conversation going on, which is somebody asked about that, and I said, well, if you had plenty of money and you could invest in any country in the world, where would you invest and why? And what can we do in South Africa to change that? But we need to speak to the petrol pump attendants, the guys at the shops. Um, unfortunately, I get a little bit jaded. I've been around the block a few times, gray hairs, and in many things, and I've... I've And we're not talking to the people who, when you talk to them and explain to them, they go, wow, that's interesting. With my book, the positivity that I've had, the number of books I've now promised to give away. But these are the people we need to talk to, and I think that's something that we need to come up with good ideas on how to do it. I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to. I think we could talk um, long about the kinds of initiatives that corporates But, um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to, ref that I reflected on before coming here is, is how we sometimes, once we sit in these offices and, 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 and work in these large corporates, we tend to forget, you know, and, and the forgetting is on many levels. And for me, the narrative needs to remind us who we actually are as a country and who we are as a nation. People forget what it was like to live in the township. I, for three years, I did a program where I visited many townships. I mean, townships I never even knew existed. And it was so interesting how I started to remember who I was because I spent time going back and I saw the toilet outside with the doors that were, that were eaten. I saw the tap that was outside barely hanging off the wall. I saw the, the, the minimalist furniture. We forget who actually is living and, and fueling this country. We forget the marginalized because we, we come to venues like this and we're speaking good English and we're surrounded by people who sound and, and like what we sound like. So we cannot forget. And that not forgetting means that every single person who has the chutzpah to sign up a business, try and run it as a one-man show, should be revered, should be supported, should be coached, should be mentored. Our offices should be open to them to enable them to actually thrive and not feel inconvenienced because they don't run as smoothly much bigger business. The key thing for me is I think a lot of us have forgotten. I think Brand SA needs to remind us you know, of who we actually are. We are not the small city of Santon. I think for me is one of the key things that Brand SA has to help us with. Right. Can, can, can I, I just like to, to add on that because there is there's also a myth, uh, and we see this a lot, of you know, big corporate must help small business. Uh, and that's true. Uh, but if that comes across almost, it's almost condescending in a way, or it's treated like it's a donor or it's a charity. And where there's far more success is when you understand that there is inherent value in small business and there's inherent value in SMMEs. Uh, you know, Nando's um, is you know, fundamentally to position ourselves as a different and better, you know, back at that point, uh, brand in the restaurant space. And you know, believe me, we're in the most competitive, one of the most competitive industries in the world. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, we've recognized that we're in intrinsic.
African. So all of our restaurants are, you know, adorned with original contemporary. Now, we didn't buy that art as a charitable donor to, to you know, poor artists. Like, on the contrary, we see that's intrinsically valuable. No one else has contemporary South African art on their walls. Um, and so, you know, us investing in the artist and the art that they produced gives us a return because we have, a, you know, a, a capital investment into art. Uh, but it also is a value exchange for that particular artist who then has their art showcased across the world. So you have a situation now where you know, the Louvre in Paris is the most visited art gallery in the world. They get about 10 million visitors a year. But Nanos gets 23 million visitors a year, which makes us you know, the world's most visited art gallery and visiting contemporary South African artists. Mm -hmm. So fundamentally that book makes us better. That also makes the artists' lives fundamentally better. And, it, and that is a far more sustainable way of you know, conducting business rather than just you know, handouts and tokenisms and gestures and filling out EDM you know, forms. That, you know, there's an inherent sense of cynicism when it comes to things like that because it doesn't overtly value smaller businesses. And so, you know, we've started to replicate that now with design as well. So all of the, you know, the tables and the furnishings and the chairs, uh, those are all, you know, made by South African artists. You know, all the uniforms uh, that are produced for, you know, Nandokas in South Africa and increasingly the world are produced here in South Africa. And that's hard, man. I mean, there are definitely cheaper ways to make chairs, let me tell you. Uh, and when you ship them to New Zealand, you know, they don't always arrive in one piece. Uh, and so you need to figure that out, and you've got to work with these people day in and day out. And that's expensive and tedious. Uh, and, and if the thought doesn't go through your mind that, gosh, there's got to be a better way, then you're not human. Uh, but I think part of, and there was the, the comment earlier, I'm sorry, I forget your name, from the publicist group. It says, you know, we have these big narratives, but we don't take the small steps. Well, the first small step is accepting responsibility for where you are, and that you're exceedingly, exceedingly privileged. Uh, and that, you know, this room probably represents a fair degree of South Africa's GDP. And how we spend that and how we, we nurture that and look after that uh, is fundamental to the first step of taking responsibility for where we are and to go forward. I think just to add what, what Doug's saying, I think what we maybe lack and what maybe Brand South Africa can help us with is to have a more systemic view of the way it all fits together. You see yourself as part of a system. You're not doing it because it's the right thing to do. It's great for your business. I'm sure people come into Nando's because they know that they're going to see beautiful South African art. It makes your business better and, and it grows. So if we can go up the ladder a little bit and look at the whole system with a little bit more perspective, then we start to see how everything's connected, how doing good is good for business in the long term, um, how empowering entrepreneurs and uplifting society makes us all better in the long term. It's a core business objective. Um, so, yeah, challenge to brand South Africa, I suppose, to help I've us have that I've got an answer to that. Yeah. Now, I can quickly jump in there. You know, we've got an uh, instrument we've developed over the years called the... Um, the Brand South Africa Masterclass. It's a very flexible instrument that we have for uh, state entities, for private sector, for state and enterprises, especially tar not targeted to the internal as well as the international audience. And what we do through there is actually try to create exactly that, that kind of systemic view. How do we position this brand? How do you execute it? But then also a lot of information that we share in terms of the profile. interested as a South African in who we are, what is the brand about, how do we profile, what's the proof points, what are the actual things that we can take out there in terms of information to position the country. We have that tool, so please make a mental note of that. If you're interested in exposing your colleagues or marketers or communicators or anybody with that, we are small, but we can make a plan to, to uh, share that instrument with you. We can do it either in an hour or a full day. So that's a definite platform that we have that we're more than happy to share. Yeah. Um, All right, thank you so much. I want to say thank you to each of our uh, panelists. Thank you for making yourselves available today. Lovely to forward. We'd uh, just like to give you a small token of our appreciation for being here today. I'm going to ask uh, Stembile Ndombela, the acting CMO of Brand South Africa, to come forward. Thank you.
much indeed to our panel really lovely hearing from you thank you very much thank you all right so next up we would like to actually go through some of the uh, the outcomes of the panel um, and I hope I am getting this in the right order uh, Minister, are you standing by to bring us the outcomes of the panel yet? Are they not yet? No, we are going to... Uh, all right. So, so Doug spoke a moment ago about the importance of, um, of investing in our South African artists and the kind of pride we need to start taking in the talented people who make up the South African arts industry. And one such individual is Butlale Bukanyu. She's an inspiring young woman who's become a trailblazer in the spoken word, and I'm going to welcome her up now. Thanks. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Are you guys good? We're here, we're here, we're here. Okay, cool. My name is Butali Buikanyo, and I am a South African poet, and I'm going to be sharing a poem with you guys today. This poem is basically just celebrating our beautiful country, South Africa. So I hope you guys enjoy. <clears throat> and it goes like this. They say home is where the heart is. And my heart, your heart, our hearts are right here in our country, South Africa. Beautiful beyond the singing of it, sun drenched and timeless from our cultures and our heritage, our languages and our beliefs, our different shades and hair textures. We stand together with hearts that beat to the rhythm of engines and to the ping of progress, like our beautiful multicolored flag, the pride of our nation. We are colorful and vibrant. We are unbreakable and unstoppable. We are resilient, determined and strong. We rise above our situations and limitations. We contribute towards positive change. We and its might in our shadows we are South Africa for it all began in 1994 after brave men and women fought uh, spilling blood to stake their claim that a new dawn arose a new narrative was written South Africa had its first democratic vote where every voice counted and every vote counted it was then that a new nation was birthed here amidst the whispering grass where Impala leap and ocean thunders. 
A nation where everyone has equal opportunities. A nation where justice prevails. And we are liberated. We are a free nation. A nation with access to healthcare, water and electricity. A nation with access to education. For like Nelson Mandela once said, education is the most powerful weapon which we can use to change the world. A nation full of possibilities and alive with opportunities. A nation that can by day strength to strength. Because we strive and we dare, ever bolding and changing to meet the challenge that widens the eye and catches the breath. We are South Africa. So let us walk with our head held high. Let us continue to live through the ideals of Ubuntu. Ubuntu, 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 Nabantu. Let our hearts beat. are a free nation we are south africa thank you very much
business, uh, as well as small business, the media and other stakeholders to try and get a sort of amalgamated vi vision of how exactly we can go forward in this regard. So to bring that to us in just a short while. I wonder if you have, in the meantime, uh, some, given some thought to the kind of pledge that you will be making on the wall. I'm not sure if you've had a chance to go there already and make your pledge and decided exactly what that is going to be. Uh, but very large pledges. I think the, the gentleman from Publicis mentioned this uh, a, a short while ago, that we tend to make these very large, uh, epic sort of promises, and, and we have these very large expectations. However, uh, it, it it could be a very small contribution that, that you would like to make, perhaps as a small business, uh, to helping to realize this vision. Whatever your capacity is, no matter the, uh, the scale of it, every little effort would be appreciated at making and South Africa. And I think all of us, no matter what industry we come from, are in the process of, of getting about what contribution we can make. I think uh, Zanele Morrison mentioned uh, members of the media as well and, and the kind of stories that we run. Had a very interesting conversation with uh, a 12-year-old on my, my 702 show last week. And, um, you know, she spoke about, for example, the representation of South African children in the media. It's something we don't often think about. We barely ever talk about it. Uh, but they presented a kind of charter, a list of demands to the media about how they wish to be depicted, about how they wish to have a be depicted as hapless victims in a bigger story that uh, that swallows them up, that they want to be participants in the way they are depicted in the media. And so I, I think there's a lot of rethinking to do in, in our individual industries as to what small changes we start to make. Uh, reading about a child who's, who's going overseas to play chess for South Africa, and, and uh, th while that might not have, have jumped out as a, an important story before, um, that to me now, and now that I'm conscientized about it, has suddenly become so much more important. Industrial industries, there are, there are probably little things like that that we haven't given much thought to that, that actually require a, a bit more thought and, and uh, a different kind of action now. Minister, are you ready to take over with the outcomes? Okay, I know I'm not supposed to stand when you stand up, so I'm going to go sit down. Thank you, <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, what came out of the interaction. There is a lady who said, uh, it's of course, within the context of not creating certainty as a country, she raised the issue of spectrum. Now, the, these are one of the issues that business has been raising with government. Uh, issues of spectrum, issues of uh, ensuring that uh, tourism thrives, issues of... So I just wanted to respond before I go to the outcome of the, of the panel. The, the president has has crafted a monthly interaction with business, labor, and civil society every month on a Monday, first Monday of the month, to deal with all these issues. What are these issues that are, are making us not to grow our economy as we should? From this perspective of business, from labor and from the community sector. We are quite happy that that arrangement is going very well, where there is engagement with the head of state on a regular basis on all these issues. As you will know, on, on tourism, for instance, cabinet has taken a decision that why do you need visas from people who come from Africa? Uh, we think that it's a step in the right direction. But also from this major markets uh, that uh, we need in our country. For instance, still in Africa, but that's one major market 
you have over 200 million people there. But China as well. Uh, so we have uh, decided as a government to do away with visas from the major markets, but also from the African continent, so that we are able to get visitors and tourists from those countries. You, you are right. Other colleagues have spoken of spectrum. Again, we have already put a policy proposition on spectrum. ICASA is now busy. But we have said to ICASA, ICASA, you can't take forever. You can't take until 2021, 2022. Within the framework of the law, can you move faster? Uh, this is what we have said to ICASA. They agree with us. Because industry and all of us have been, working for, have been waiting for this spectrum for years now. We can't wait any longer. We, we fully agree with you. But we have had a discussion and an engagement with ICASA. By the way, ICASA was also brought in the meeting that the president chairs, the presidential working committee of labor, business, and community to explain themselves how fast are they going to move. Even on the issue of uh, visas and e-visas, what are we doing in the markets, major markets, what are we doing in Africa? We even brought in that meeting of the president with business and labor and community, we brought the Minister of Home Affairs to explain what it is that we are doing by um, dealing away with uh, visas in the African continent and also in major markets, India and, 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 and China. So we, we are saying we, we are fully cognizant of these constraints and we are dealing with them at, at government level. Of course, in consultation with the tourism authorities that are involved in this area of work. Uh, we, we, we know that our SOEs have not brought us uh, wonderful slips over the past few years. Um, and again, we are dealing with those, the major one being your ESCOM, your SAA, your, I hope they are here, your SABC. Um, we, because we, we believe that, yes, we should continue ensuring that these SOEs deliver on their mandate, but we should not continue at all costs. So we, we believe that the Minister of Finance will be able to speak to these issues this coming Wednesday. This coming Wednesday. What? Uh, how do we deal with this? SOE is uh, moving forward. So let's await the medium term budget policy statement by our finance minister. Of course, these are difficult questions, some of them. Uh, do you stop bailing out ESCOM? And if you stop, what is the impact on business? What is the impact? on those sectors of the economy that rely on electricity and certainty in electricity uh, <coughs> uh, giving or uh, creation in the country. So these are some of the difficult issues that we have been confronted with, but we will speak to these matters on Wednesday. Uh, what the panel, again, let's thank the panelists for a wonderful job that they have done on this platform. Uh, Zanele, Morrison, or oh, including the chair, by the way, Joanne, Joseph, thank you very much. The Doug from the None of us are anywhere in the continent or anywhere in the world. Once you see Nando's, say, yo, yo, this is home. Shani <laughs> uh, K, again, thank you very much. And Hussein, thank you. 
The issues that have come out, and again, we wouldn't like to go into details. Issues that, have, that are cross-cutting that have come out is that we need to come up with a singular positioning statement as South Africa. What is this good sell about us that we want? It's something that perhaps uh, Brand SA and other agencies should look at, including Invest SA and Tourism SA. It's something that perhaps we should work together on what is this singular positioning statement. Uh, brand can succeed by focusing on the strengths uh, and by us talking about the good stuff, why is, of course, not forgetting about our challenges? And this is what has come out here, that we must, any, any good brand puts forward its best foot uh, and uh, not the terrible one, the stinking one. You put forward your best foot, uh, and that's what we're saying, that notwithstanding our difficulties, but there are indeed wonderful strengths that we are endowed with as a country. Um, so let's always put forward those strengths. We also, this discussion has said, we must never forget to celebrate. You know, 25 years into democracy, at times we take certain things for granted, including our constitution. It's still the past. Uh, we must continue to celebrate our constitution and celebrate the freedoms. As colleagues have said, uh, in other countries, when you write bad about a government, the following day you are no longer in, in office as an entity or a broadcaster or as a media house. Not in this country. Not in this country. Media freedoms are enshrined. Uh, that we take from our constitutions. They are also heavily in, enshrined. So we must celebrate all these things that we are, that we are given by our constitution. this panel that we must also unlock corporate South Africa. Promote and again promote transformation in the corporate environment. And this is what we have been trying to do for quite some time. But let's move with speed uh, in promoting transformation. Maybe I'm, I'm not very much sure whether we should promote, we should promote transformation or enforce transformation. Uh, also say that we must focus on what makes us better than what makes us different. Uh, colleagues say that we must also build cohesion and cover the positiveness that is abound in brand essay. <clears throat> we must continue sustainable engagements with all stakeholders, which is what they appreciate with you, Brand SA. By bringing us here together, you are ensuring that we sustain the engagements with all stakeholders that makes Brand SA tick. Uh, create an inclusive environment where everybody believes that we are part of Brand SA, where everybody feels that we are part of this country. We must remove, as we have said at the beginning, policy uncertainty and ensure that we promote a secure economic environment. Uh, that we must invest because it's in our interest as big players in the business environment 
to invest in SMMEs. So we must invest in SMMEs and promote partnerships in the business and corporate environment. Now, these are the few take-home uh, matters that would have arisen from the discussion, panel discussion that we had here, which might also be referred to as cross-cutting themes that are emerging from the discussion that we have had. Again, thank you very much for giving us this opportunity once again. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Minister. I'd like to now call on Ms. Dulisile Manzini. She's the acting CEO of Brand South Africa, and she's going to offer the vote of thanks and closure for us. Thank you, Wow, what a beautiful day. Indeed, can we clap for ourselves? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Minister, our panelists and guest speakers, members of the media, and gentlemen, you are greeted. Let me start off by thanking each and every one of you for joining us here today, for sharing your insights, concerns, and your good ideas of how we can revive our nation brand and advance this country's reputation and competitiveness. At the start, Minister Mtembu highlighted a number of competitive strengths of the nation brand, including our ranking on indices that measure different aspects of our global competitiveness. He also spoke about the very real challenges we face as a country and the government's response to these challenges. His words showed us that government's eyes are wide open and that there is willingness to deal decisively with what gets thrown its way. Let's also not forget that the well-traveled Tebe Ikalafeng told us earlier today, if we don't support our brands, our countries and the continent is not going anywhere. We've learned that it's important to assert ourselves and our identity. And one of the ways we need to do that is to support our brands. We need to be by Africans up from 17% to way more. One of the statements that stood out most for me today is the one that we as Brand South Africa often repeat. Namely, that a brand promise has to be believable. You have to tell the truth to be believable. And that is, it's not believable that allows people through our humor to laugh at the same things so that we can be sad about the same things. We have taken note of the pledges already made by our panelists, and we have taken note of the concerns and challenges highlighted by those who spoke their minds. I want to thank the acting chief marketing officer, Mrs. Tembi Lendombela, and the team at Brand South Africa. <laughs> Fellow South Africans and nation brand advocates, I hope that the discussions and insights shared with us today have given us all some food for thought and let us feeling well equipped to meet the challenge posed by the Honorable Minister Mtembo at the beginning of the day, that we find our niche where we can contribute to the positive story of this country. As I close, so to again borrow the words of our president and say, watch this space. And to also ask all of you to join hands and assist us in telling the good story of South Africa. I thank you. Things that I don't need, no. Thank you very much for that, Ms. Manzini.
Ladies and gentlemen, that brings us uh, to the end of our formalities for this afternoon. Thank you very much for your attendance, your in engagement, and your contributions to the conversation as well. Uh, uh, and I also want to thank you for the pledges that you are going to make and carry out over the next few months. I trust uh, you're all fired up in uh, reviving our nation brand. Uh, there will be an opportunity also for media briefing and interviews now. Thank you very much. Lunch will be served. Enjoy that, and when you leave, do travel safely. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.